connecting investors, financial institutions, and businesses around the world. Luxembourg is a center of excellence for global finance. Recognized for its unique international financial expertise, Luxembourg is solution-driven, stable, and open to innovation. A pioneer and global leader in sustainable finance, we help build a better tomorrow today. An international financial center and a European capital, Luxembourg is an exceptional and welcoming place to work and live. Discover what we can do for you. Welcome to the China Finance Forum, bringing together international experts and practitioners to discuss the macroeconomic, geopolitical, and regulatory environment in which the global investment industry is operating. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. A warm welcome to this eighth edition of the China Finance Forum, coming to you live from the European Broadcasting Center in the heart of Luxembourg. My name is Jude Bogner, and once again, I'm truly honored and delighted to lead you through this digital event on behalf of Luxembourg for Finance. First up, we would like to express our gratitude to our sponsors and our media partner, the Financial Times. We also thank all our speakers for setting aside time to share with their wisdom with us, and we thank all of you who are joining us from around the world, from 48 countries. As ever, this will be recorded, and the recording will be made available to you after the live stream is over. Just look for the email in your inbox. It will hold a link that will take you right back to the website of Luxembourg for Finance, where you are watching in this very moment. Now, as the world's second largest economy, with a population of about 1.4 billion people, China also offers one of the largest savings pools on the planet, with a savings rate of 45% of GDP. And this growing pool of wealth to date remains largely untapped by foreign financial firms. Of course, we know that foreign investors in China have generated handsome returns thanks to decades of strong economic growth and increasing ease of access to China's capital markets. Now, at the same time, Chinese investors and companies are more and more looking outbound, taking their products, their capital, their services and indeed their innovation to bear on an international stage. These in and outbound activities are met with a landscape of increasing complexities and changing dynamics. And over the next three hours, we want to investigate these dynamics and complexities with our esteemed guests. We kick it off with a welcome address by Luxembourg's new Minister of Finance, followed by a keynote with Jörg Wutke, who just put down his mantle as President of the European Chamber of Commerce in China and will reflect with us over his more than three decades of living and working in China at what may be next. Then we'll have a panel session on how international investors are viewing the Chinese market. Then we'll hear how Chinese digital innovation is indeed going global with Ant Group's Leiming Chen and Zenon Capron from Capron Asia. Our second panel session will address what Chinese investors are looking for in the global markets. Next up is a deep dive on the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, also known as the GBA, and its appeal for foreign investors with Dr. King Lun Ao from Hong Kong's Financial Services Development Council. And we'll wrap it up with a conversation about how to harness global finance to fight the climate crisis, perfectly timed with the upcoming COP28 at the end of the month. And that will be a conversation between Julie Becker from the Luxembourg Stock Exchange and one of China's leading voices on green finance, Dr. Ma Jun. But first, it's my great pleasure to welcome to the China Finance from Luxembourg's new Minister of Finance, His Excellency Minister Gilles Roth. Minister, we are delighted to have you with us today. The floor is yours.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to address you today on the occasion of the annual China Finance Forum. Also, I have only been Minister of Finance for a few days. I am very well aware of the important role of our China relations, be it on a bilateral level or in the international context as it is a topic I have followed closely for many years as a member of Parliament. I now look forward to continuing to develop these relations in my new capacity. Last year's forum took place against the backdrop of Russia's war against Ukraine, macroeconomic uncertainty, high energy costs and geopolitical tensions. If anything, the world has become even more complex in the 12 months that have passed since. Beyond the human tragedy, the recent outbreak of war in the Middle East has further increased global risks. The global economy continues to slow down. Moreover, the climate crisis has lost none of its urgency. Faced with a perma-crisis of such complexity, it is more important than ever not to resort to simplistic solutions, but rather encourage multilateral exchanges. There are positive signals. Chief among them is the recent detente between the US and China and the clear willingness to continue to engage in dialogue. The meeting between President Xi and President Biden last week in San Francisco has sent a strong signal that, despite many differences, the US and China continue to engage with each other constructively. The EU should not only welcome, but also actively encourage this dialogue. As a trusted partner focused on multilateralism and adherence to international norms, the EU can play a key role in fostering and constructive multilateral dialogue. Luxembourg has always been keen to strengthen such dialogue and promote mutual understanding, and the China Finance Forum is part of these efforts. The reasons for continued engagement are clear and compelling. The challenges we face today are too vast and complex for any one nation to tackle alone. At the political level, dialogue between the US, China and Europe has the potential to promote peace and stability. As a superpower, China is part of the solution and also has a significant responsibility, including when it comes to de-escalating and finding solutions to regional conflicts and wars. Economically, the United States, China and the EU are moreover deeply intertwined. Together, they represent roughly half of global GDP. This economic interdependence demands cooperation, not confrontation, to ensure global stability and growth. It is therefore very encouraging to see that both the EU and the US have clearly understood that decoupling can only lead to a dead end. I am convinced that the EU, as a champion of free trade and fair competition, has a particular responsibility to show that there are alternative paths to protectionism while promoting rules-based trade. As President von der Leyen said in the State of Union address, Europe is open for competition, not for a race to the bottom. It is also absolutely clear that we cannot sacrifice our European values on the altar of global trade. This is why it is all the more important to maintain a regular and frank exchange with China on multiple fronts and through multiple channels. Importantly, if we want to spur global economic growth, from which all regions benefit, we will need access to global, free-flowing capital. In short, we need interconnected financial markets, not fragmentation. Let me assure you that Luxembourg, under the new government, will remain committed to promote cross-border financial services and defends the principles of European single market that remains open to the world. This is especially important at a time when our economies are in the midst of a digital and green transition 
that will be as transformative and disruptive as the second industrial revolution at the turn of the 20th century. The COP28 next month will be an opportunity to take stock of progress and to collectively step up our efforts to reach net zero. The financial sector will play a central role in these global efforts. Ranked as the EU's greenest financial center, Luxembourg has long been a pioneer. Yet, it is not enough to focus on our own national or regional efforts to achieve net zero and make our economies more sustainable. As the world's largest economic blocs, the US, China and the EU have a responsibility to lead by example and to support less wealthy nations in their efforts to mitigate and adapt to climate change. International convergence and interoperability of standards will be a key part of channeling investments into the green transition across borders and regions. The common ground taxonomy between the EU and China is an important step in the right direction. The climate crisis is thus a perfect illustration of the fact that the world's leading economies need to work together to not only tackle the problems of today, but also those we will be facing tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, together, the United States, China and the European Union can and must form a powerful triad for peace, stability and prosperity in our interconnected world. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Minister Roth, for setting the stage for our conversations today. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speaker. He is what you would call a Chung Wa Tong, an old China hand who speaks excellent Mandarin and has been living and working in China for more than 30 years. Now, over and above his day job as chief representative in China for one of Germany's DAX heavyweights, he's also a well-known champion for European businesses because for many years he's been conveying the concerns and wishes of German and European businesses to the political leaders in Beijing, in Brussels, in Berlin and other European capitals. Between 2001 and 2004 he served as the chair of the German Chamber of Commerce in China and then after helping to found the European Chamber of Commerce in China in 2000 he went on to serve as its president for altogether three terms starting in 2007 with some pauses in between all the way until May this year. He is also a member of the advisory board of Germany's foremost think tank on China, the Mercator Institute for China Studies, also known as MERIX, since it was conveyed in Berlin in 2013. And I'm truly delighted that he's here with us in the studio actually right now to reflect on more than three decades in China and what may be next for doing business there. So warm welcome to Jörg Wutke. Jörg, great to have you with me here in the studio. We're all here and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Judith. It's wonderful to be here and also in person. It makes such a difference. And I welcome everyone who is online. Uh, it's a great uh, show in Luxembourg. Well, 30 years is unbelievable how fast it passed by. I came for the first time into China in 1982. A couple of my friends um, and myself uh, boarded a train in Heidelberg in Germany and uh, stayed in China for three months uh, trying to find out what this country is all about. And little did we know that actually uh, we're going to stay. I, I stayed on for 33 years altogether. Um, what a comeback story it was. What an economic, world-class comeback story China was. Uh, again, I couldn't see that coming in the 80s uh, when everybody was wearing uh, blue jackets or green jackets. Uh, the married ladies had short hair and the unmarried had braids. Uh, now China is standing for top-end fashion and diversity and, of course, has evolved in so many years so fast. But if we just have a look at uh, this economy in comparison to other economies, we see that actually also the Asian tigers, such as Korea, Taiwan and Japan, had a similar growth story. So we can actually look back and compare and we also can try to see into the future in order to see uh, where China might be heading. 
The World Bank did a nice study for the European Chamber two years ago uh, looking into the GDP per capita in power purchase in parity terms uh, over the years after opening up in different time zones. Japan went first, uh, then came uh, Taiwan, then came Korea and China in 1980. So you can sort of put a layer there and see how that developed over the uh, first 30 years. And it turns out to be that the uh, development was identical. Identical means that we had huge growth in all the other three economies. But of course, China was a different uh, country because 1.4 billion makes just such a heck of a difference. We asked the World Bank to look into the future of uh, uh, until 2050. And there we can see three scenarios they came up with. One is the muddling through scenario, which means that China is doing a little bit of opening and uh, does the kind of speed that they have pronounced. Uh, then China will go from $17,000 per capita uh, in 2021 to about 46,000 US dollars in 2050. So sizable growth uh, across the board. Um, we had uh, a uh, study on self-reliance. Uh, China is aiming for self-reliance in many ways. Uh, that, of course, impairs growth potential. And China will still grow quite, quite nicely, but will end up in 2050 at about uh, 34,000 US dollars per capita. So twice what they have now, but of course it took so much longer in order to achieve this kind of growth. And then China will open up. Uh, the kind of uh, globalization story that you associate with Zhu uh, Rongji, the former prime minister, as well as the WTO session. And then China takes off like a rocket and clicks uh, at the $56,000 per capita in 2050. Huge differences. Of course, we don't know what China is choosing. But again, uh, we are seeing now more ideology, more politics in decision making. Self-reliance is a worry, not just uh, in China, but also in other countries around the world. And so the question that we put forward is, does China really want to sacrifice $22,000 per capita as a difference, best case and self-reliance case on the altar of ideology? Well, what are we seeing today in China? One recurring item that has been covered by the Chamber in 2009 and 2016 was overcapacity. China is ridden by overcapacity, always coming up in waves. And now we have such a wave all over again, lack of demand, of course. <clears throat> if you look at the data set that uh, HSBC published a while ago, China is, has around about 60%, 60% of global manufacturing capacity, staggering. Uh, they produce 31% of all products, and they are just standing for 14% of global consumption. So something is out of whack over there. Um, uh, we have huge idle facilities and capacities in the industry, and of course that turns into a ferocious uh, uh, price war that we can see, for example, in the car industry. We already now can see uh, the demand is going down. Uh, we are waiting for the Chinese consumer to pick up again. But China has one exit valve, one rescue mechanism that's called export. And export it does, incredibly. Last year, China dispatched 6.4 million containers from China into the European 27 member states. 6.4. What came back? 1.6 only. 1.6. The ratio is around about 3.6 to 1, and in the first half of this year, we were told it's 3.9 to 1. And that is pre-new energy vehicles. China could actually export many more of these fantastic cars. I call them cars despite the fact that actually they are, I think, mobile phones on wheels. Uh, but they don't have these roll-on, roll-off ships that uh, is needed in order to ship these cars around. Uh, normally, in good old days, it was four ships ordered every year by the international shipping agencies. Over the last uh, year, uh, China and the shipping agencies uh, ordered 170 ships, 170. Unbelievable. There are normally five to 6,000 cars each, and uh, BYD, for example, order chips that can take eight to 9,000 cars. So once these ships enter the market in 2025, 26, and all of them by 27, you see in 27 an additional export capacity of cars or computers on wheels by 4.1 million cars. Where are they going? That's the thing that is now uh, discussed in the European Commission in Brussels. 
because the assumption that they will end up in India or in Japan, Korea and the United States is far-fetched. They possibly really will enter the European Union and they will enter uh, south, uh, the global south. So in a way, do we want them? They are fantastic products. They help us in the green transition. At the same time, we have supply chains to reconsider. So it will be a tough call in Brussels, Paris and Berlin how to deal with that and we can expect something in July. I hope it will not be protectionist. Well, we have um, um, the trade going between Europe and China. Again, the containers speak one language, uh, but the export in dollar terms speaks another language. As European 27 last year, we just exported 23% uh, more into China than into Switzerland. Um, there's always this uh, ac accusation in public uh, realm that we are overexposed to China and we're too dependent on China. If you just look at the containers and the sales that we have, as a matter of fact, it looks exactly the other way around. China needs the European consumer and China needs the market that it finds and China is not open enough yet in order to guarantee the exports that we deserve. Um, the position paper of the chamber, my successor Jens Esklon had about 1,058 points to display. So there's a long way to go in order to China really follow the language they come up with as opening up. Uh, it's not there yet. If you look into a foreign direct investment, another point where politicians and NGOs say we are overexposed to China, just look at the data set. Uh, European Union 27 companies on average ex, uh, invest in China 8 to 9 billion dollars every year. Um, that sounds a lot, but if you look into the magnitude of things, it's actually quite little. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, four uh, European uh, German companies in particular are standing for one third of this investment. It's the three German car companies, Benz, uh, Volkswagen and BMW and the chemical giant BSF. One third. Where are the others? Well, we have a situation now uh, where basically uh, we think we're underinvested in China. Just consider that China stands for 33 to 37% on global car market and 50% on the new energy vehicle market. And in chemistry, 50% of the global market is in China. So if you're not in China, if you're not competing there, you actually might not be the relevant global player that you think you are. And that gets me to another point where actually I guess it is important that we stay in the battlefield market China. Because China is a research and development story. I published a paper in uh, April with uh, Merix, uh, the uh, Berlin-based uh, think tank on China, uh, indicating that actually China has a very small R, very basic uh, research is not really conducted to the uh, point where it could be. We have more are happening in the headquarters around the world. But China is a world champion in the big fat D, I call it. It's development. China has uh, very demanding customers, incredibly risk savvy entrepreneurs, and they just can't wait. They change products fast. They have what we call the China speed, and hence for us it's a fitness club where we're trying to be on top of that. And you can see it already that products that might look stale and not very attractive, if Chinese entrepreneurs have their hands on it, uh, all of a sudden they become faster, better and cheaper. So in a way, uh, it is very important to actually realize that uh, in order to be on top of your game, uh, many ways the Chinese consumers, as difficult as they are, uh, have actually help you to get there. Another point uh, from my side is uh, the capability on engineering and universities in China. It's underreported, but China has 50 out of the best 100 uh, engineering uh, universities in the world. 50 out of 100. Same applies to chemistry, where they have half of the global 100. Uh, in biotechnology, in medicine, it's a single digit, so vast differences. But if you are in engineering, if you are in this field and you're lacking uh, workers, uh, engineers, top-end engineers, uh, China's the place to go, and I know uh, that in Chengdu, for example, a DAX company has uh, 400 uh, engineers working on their projects across the world uh, in order to actually help the shortcomings in staffing that uh, they have seen in, in Europe. So in a way, uh, look, look it up and see where there's quality. Uh, it is uh, very important to see where the clusters are, universities as well as companies, uh, and there are many of them uh, in China. Let me also say that um, we have uh, a dependency discussion with uh, China. 
and uh, we had a chamber paper out uh, 2021 on decoupling, the dangers of decoupling. Nobody wants to decouple, but unfortunately it takes place in certain segments. For example, in the information communication technologies where uh, Huawei is struggling in Europe and elsewhere in the world and Ericsson and Nokia have been pushed to less than 2% of the 5G network despite the quality and the performance uh, of their equipment uh, everywhere in the world. So that's a real danger we have. Uh, we also see a decoupling in some areas where we as companies operating in China feel challenged by data transfers, something which actually requires the government to look into our major data uh, that we are sharing with headquarters. I think that is really a hurdle for doing major research and uh, data point gathering in, in China. So where is the, where is the challenge? Well, uh, von der Leyen, president of the European Commission, came up with a very good speech in March, I guess it was, uh, uh, talking about de-risking. I think it's very important to understand that de-risking is not decoupling with European characteristics. It is a project which stands for itself where Europe says we want to engage with China. We want to engage with China, but we have to align where the risks are. The risks are not 6.4 million containers coming into the European market. Some of the stuff in there is certainly a challenge to us because we are totally dependent on China in maybe 20 or 30 product items, such as uh, pharmaceutical precursors, the famous APIs, where we can see that uh, we have uh, experienced in winter last year a shortage of painkillers, contrast uh, uh, material for scanning for cancer, and there is something we have to do about it. We need industrial policy, and actually I'm aware of pro uh, projects that have been ongoing in the capitals of Europe in order to address exactly that point. Then we have magnesium, we have vitamin B, and certainly the very famous rare earth. Germany, France, Sweden, uh, Sweden in particular has a problem with graphite now getting it out of China, uh, have to put their heads together in order to see A, where can they find substitution, substitutions, other countries uh, where we find it easier and less politically challenged to source at the same time we maybe also have to look and spend our resources in new technologies which require less of these products or put an emphasis on recycling, particular on the area on rare earth. So yes, there are dependency and yes, we have to de-risk as does China. China in many ways were inventing de-risking many years ago by actually excluding American European companies from the internet uh, and, and other businesses, again, uh, Nokia and Ericsson's market share is less than 2% despite the stellar performance. Huawei is still very prominent in Europe. Uh, in Germany itself, it stands for 59% of the uh, 5G uh, network. So in a way, de-risking is something where we need a toolbox. There is one. Uh, the Commission is working on it, and uh, you in business should be aware of uh, the paper that came out in June called Security uh, uh, business security on China. You can find it in the European Chamber website or in uh, the European Commission website. Two more topics before I fold it uh, is one is US, China and Europe relationship. We are very happy that the Biden visit, uh, no, the Xi Jinping Biden uh, summit uh, took place as it did. Nothing really major came out of it for business. It was good that they started military to military. Uh, cooperation. It was excellent that uh, they addressed now the opiate challenges uh, that came into Mexico and challenges the health of American citizens. And we have more flights in the pipeline and other areas. But again, it was a little bit of a downer when it comes to the business engagement. And I think there more has to be done. Uh, sanctions will possibly continue many ways. I don't see the U.S. getting away from the sanctions, tightening the sanctions. There will be more coming. And China has to see how they respond to this one. We in Europe have basically no sanctions imposed. Um, uh, but we, we have the challenges, of course, of public opinion and in business. Again, if the uh, trade is so lopsided as it is, if the overcapacity in China is not reined in, I'm afraid that uh, Europe will put up some borders for Chinese goods entering this economy. So I guess that nothing major uh, will happen between U.S. and China as we enter the silly season in the U.S., meaning the elections coming up. The good news is it might not get worse. 
uh, but we should not be naive to believe that everything is turning rosy now. I don't see this at all. Another topic that is, of course, floating in the business community is Taiwan. You know, there are dates out there by generals from the U.S. 2025 attack. Uh, Xi Jinping gets always quoted as his army has to be ready in 2027 in order to win a war. Uh, that doesn't mean that China's planning a war. Actually, I think the, uh, the awareness in Beijing is very much so uh, after particular looking at the failure of Russia uh, invading Ukraine, the, the hammering the, the army took there, uh, comparing it with their own army. Is, as Xi Jinping put it, his army ready to fight a war? Um, I think that also uh, Beijing has been studying intensively the side effects of a blockade or let alone a war. Uh, it would be an exercise uh, building up over months, uh, getting the ships ready, and that period itself will already cause jitters in the global market. Uh, people will uh, try to get the money out of China. There will be major uncertainties um, uh, similar to the one that uh, we have seen in the buildup of the tanks on the border to Ukraine. Many of us didn't believe that Putin will actually pull the trigger. So uh, there is this anxiety built up. And then China studies the sanctions, uh, how companies have left the marketplace, how they have moved out of uh, Russia. And of course, uh, they're doing a sensible study in order to see how would it impact their own economy. And certainly it will not to their benefit, uh, let alone it would be to the benefit of companies from OECD countries. So I see a lot of realism uh, in the discussion there. And I guess uh, we have to just uh, make very sure that with an assurances of a one-child uh, policy, we don't step uh, on this literally on the mine uh, that then triggers uh, actions that are very difficult to control. So Taiwan is a very dear and very important uh, partner for European business. As a matter of fact, uh, Europe has invested $50 billion into the economy of Taiwan. The Americans 22, Japan 12. So we are massive investors. We have something at stake in this economy over there mostly Dutch, mostly wind farms and uh, computer suppliers. So in a way, uh, that is very important for us to realize that deep connections with uh, Taiwan on the economic field doesn't mean that we have to politically recognize that and uh, disturb the picture and the status quo with which we actually have lived quite well for a long period of time. One point of discussion in the corridors of Beijing is if there are sanctions on China, one that will bite deeply is on the aviation sector because the aviation sector in Russia has been hit. Uh, Airbus and Boeing don't sell anymore, don't uh, maintain the planes anymore. But China relies totally on foreign planes, on totally on foreign technologies. Comic to some extent, I would say 85% is a foreign plane, in particular on the turbine side. So I guess that Beijing knows very well that they live quite good with status quo as the relationship is. And I virtually, I don't see anytime soon any uh, blockade or any uh, war in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, there might be occasional flare-ups, uh, of course, but I guess uh, people are in Beijing, as in DC, hopefully are sane enough in order to keep us on track of not deglobalizing with a war or blockade in the Taiwan Strait. Last point from my side is, uh, of course, uh, uh, what I call in my recent speech is, shall I stay or shall I go? Well, personally, I will go. I will leave China next year in July after 34 years uh, as uh, someone who has enjoyed uh, daily life there, I brought up my kids uh, in, the, in Beijing and in Shanghai. Um, I will move to Washington, so and I will work on China from Washington. So I will leave China, but China certainly will not leave me. But as a businessman, shall I stay or shall I go? Well, we see a lot of outflow of financial capital right now because, again, uh, interest rate differentials, but also the overcapacity is making money to make money in China really, really difficult these days. But if you are in the real economy, such as in machine building and cars and chemistry, there is no other place. Now, if you just look up. Uh, how big the Indian, the obvious next China in many ways is supposed to be India, how big India is in its GDP in comparison with China. And you will notice that as a matter of fact, uh, India now is 15 billion US dollars GDP smaller than the People's Republic of China, 15 billion. Now, if you just assume a measly growth in China, just to provoke you a little bit, somewhere between one and 2%, um, then, uh, and India will be certainly growing very strong over the next uh, years, uh, say six, seven percent. 
Uh, I think it was HSBC who did a study on this one. And in 2028, so in five years from now, uh, China will be bigger in its economy than India by a cool 17.5 trillion US dollars, 17.5 trillion. So they go from 15 to 17.5. Well, that all has to do with the base effect uh, that China is already such a big cake and, and India is just about to uh, grow up. Uh, and I am sure that India will close this gap in the 30s. But again, you have to ask yourself, uh, do I want to be part of this 17.5 trillion economy or not? And 17.5 is a cool figure because as a matter of fact, it is the size of the economy of the European, uh, European uh, economy as we have it here. So my conclusion here is that basically um, we can learn with China, uh, we can live with China. The European Commission has a cool uh, a triple word for it, it says partner, and in many ways we are excellent partners. Uh, we are competitors, certainly on third markets. Uh, that is a challenge that we will face in particular with the overcapacity coming out of China. And we are systemic rivals. China doesn't like to hear that, but I think it is clear to anyone who has studied communism that actually came not far away from here, from Trier, uh, uh, in comparison to struggles with capitalism. And China voices that very openly themselves, that they think they are the better system. And President Xi Jinping has made it very clear that for him, uh, ideology is really important. Uh, just in his recent speeches in NPC, for example, he mentioned Marx 35 times, a market uh, 15 times. So in a way, that's the reality. We have to face reality. We're having to find the real mechanisms in order to engage ourselves. And again, final word from my side, don't forget the innovative power, or the development power in China and the brain power you find there to develop your business, not only in Beijing, Chengdu or Shenzhen, but also anywhere else in the world. It was that over to you. Thank you so much, Jörg, for this tour de force, very grounded, but also inspiring look ahead. If you allow one follow-up question, I know you're very much embedded in the real economy, yeah. but given the landscape and the dynamics you're describing, what's your perception of foreign financial investors just creating that bridge into our first panel session? <laughs> But Nicola, who is going to run the panel, will go for this question as well. I mean, we have seen a massive outflow recently. Uh, the word in the market is China's non-investable. Again, that's not the real economy. That's the, that's the perception of it. But again, the interest differential will close. Eventually, China will now step in, stabilizing the real estate market. Uh, will hopefully find a mechanism that companies not just make cars, but also make money. I think there will be uh, uh, restructuring in many of these sectors. It can't go on like that. So I I wouldn't give up on the fact that maybe in 2024, second half, uh, we have a much more robust economy and that might reflect on money coming back again. You know, It's the fickery money that goes in and out uh, and now the returns are much higher elsewhere. Maybe then China can turn the corner. Thank you so much, Jörg Wutke. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank, Thank you. you. And ladies and gentlemen, this takes us nicely to our first panel session, which will discuss what international investors are looking for and how they're viewing the Chinese market. And I'd like to remind ourselves of a statement that stuck with me from last year's China Finance Forum, which echoes in some ways what Jörg has just mentioned. Um, and it came from HSBC's Fred Neumann, who will be on the first panel. And when he discussed the macroeconomic um, that we see in China that's behind the headline growth number, he said China is still the game in town when it comes to investing in Asia. So I'm looking forward to hear how well the statement has aged and I hand it over and indeed warm, offer a warm welcome to the moderator for this panel session, Luxembourg for Finance's very own Chief Executive, Nicola Macke. Good to have you with me. What an honor, Nicola. I hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Judith, uh, for this very kind introduction. Thank you for teeing up for us so uh, eloquently and competently as usual. 
Thank you also to Jörg Wuttke for really setting the scene. Uh, there is certainly plenty that we can come back to and we definitely will. Now I uh, have the great pleasure in the next uh, 35 minutes to be discussing how international investors are viewing the Chinese market with two great experts on this question. One is Catherine Young, the uh, <coughs> investment director at Fidelity International. Uh, she has been in Hong Kong for many years now with uh, Fidelity, actually. Uh, as the name says, you have been very uh, fidel, as they say in French, to Fidelity. Um, you hail from Australia and have uh, also uh, been educated there and then moved on to Hong Kong, uh, where you worked also uh, at Reuters and at uh, other financial institutions before joining Fidelity in uh, 2006. Somebody else who joined uh, Hong Kong in 2006 is our other speaker, namely Frederick uh, Newman. He holds a PhD in uh, International Economics and Asian Studies, has taught uh, Asian economics at various American universities, and since 2006, by coincidence, the same year as Catherine, has moved to Hong Kong where he is uh, uh, with HSBC and more particularly their uh, chief economist for Asia. Welcome to both of you, Catherine and Frederick. Now, before we get to the precise question of how investors are viewing the Chinese market, I think there were quite a number of points that Jörg was making about the Chinese economy, and I would very briefly like to come back to also get a better sense of where is this economy heading and who better for that than uh, Frederick. Maybe you can help us make sense of all these messages we get, most of them very gloomy. However, the IMF has recently uh, revised China's growth rate back up to 5.4%. I don't know if that is good news. To me, it sounds like good news because China's economy, of course, has so much grown over the last years that 5.4% of a much larger economy is obviously a bigger piece of the pie than uh, what 6.8% were before. Um, but yet it also announces lower growth for the years to come. But tell us a little bit how you see the Chinese economy and where it is heading. Well, uh, thank you, Nicola, for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to join you here uh, at Luxembourg for finance. Um, look, make, make no mistake, the Chinese economy is facing a lot of challenges. Uh, but some of the headlines that you read about China probably overstate the negativity somewhat. If you look at China at the moment, there's still areas of growth, uh, make no mistake. Uh, manufacturing investment growing around 5%, uh, infrastructure investment growing somewhere between 5 and 7%, consumer spending on services in particular is growing as well. And so it looks like the economy overall will achieve roughly 5% growth, maybe even touch more for this year. Um, now, there are sectors that are very much headwinds, the property sector in particular. Uh, local government debt also remains an issue. The export sector has not grown as quickly. Um, but these are issues that the government still has, to some extent, the policy levers to address, that is to uh, backstop so it doesn't necessarily uh, turn into a much bigger near-term problem. So that means for next year, 5% growth is still within reach. Now, another reason why we have these negative headlines is not just because of the current state of the economy, but because of concerns of the structural growth drivers. The demographics has been a lot discussed, the buildup in debt, for example. All of this is true, but, and you just hinted at this, it does look like that we're shifting down on Chinese growth. We were used to growth of 6, 7, 8%. We're now looking more trend-wise at 5, maybe even 4.5% growth. But it's not the end of the world. It's the second largest economy and something that Jörg said as well. That still creates a lot of incremental GDP and a lot of opportunities for businesses who want to do uh, a business in China. We are seeing some of the main numbers, in particular FDI, really declining in 25 years. This, is, this year is the first year where we have net outflows of uh, foreign direct investment. How do you see this? 
That's right. But uh, put it into context, last year was a record year for foreign direct investment despite the coronavirus. Uh, so, yes, this year some of the numbers have been worse. Um, there are some uh, subtleties or nuances we should uh, take into account. One is that there is a growing interest rate gap between China and the and the dollar dollar interest rates, and that has meant that uh, many companies are shifting money overseas to take advantage of these higher interest rates. Um, and certainly, we see that affecting the FDI numbers. For example, fewer companies are reinvesting momentum profits in China. They rather park the money overseas, earn some interest, and might come back at some point. The other issue is that Chinese companies are increasingly investing outside of China, and we're looking at net FDI numbers. So uh, and more and more money is coming out now that the borders are reopened. We see Chinese companies investing very aggressively overseas. Uh, so I think we need to be careful to kind of ride off foreign investment altogether. Uh, yes, there are cyclical headwinds. Um, maybe medium term, we might not get back to record numbers, but still, China still attracts from especially large companies in the automotive sector, in the chemical sector, and the machinery sector, uh, in the consumer sector, even, uh, say, luxury goods sector, for example, a lot of foreign investment at the moment. Okay, and maybe over to Catherine um, to see how this plays out what Frederick has said in the FDI sector in portfolio investments. This morning, our media partner, the Financial Times, has published an article saying that 75% of the money that flew into, that has flown into China uh, since the beginning of the year has actually been withdrawn again. I suppose it's the same factors that also uh, impact portfolio investments, interest rate uh, differentials and so on. How do you see the flows in the portfolio investment world. So exactly what Frederick highlighted in terms of the headline news really dominating. And that headline news, especially the further you get away from your investment destination, so in this case China, the more opaque it tends to be. And I would argue that actually we're just seeing such bearish news flow. So Clearly, year to date, we've seen preferred markets in Asia. So Japan, which have seen about, or the countries equity-wise, have seen about 27 billion US in terms of foreign institutional investor flows. And then India, because of the growth that we heard earlier about India's uh, growth profile, that's also dominated in terms of, of flows into the region at about 12 billion. But it's very interesting because if you look at flows into the Asia market, so that's the mainland Chinese market, from foreigners, it's been around 10 billion. So not that little or not that much versus India. But this is quite staggering. Chinese mainland money coming into Hong Kong through what we call the, the Southbound Stock Connect program has been 40 billion year to date. And I want to emphasize the growing importance for the domestic investor because you're going to see the financial services sector in China really evolve and develop. And you'll see better run companies. You'll see the focus on total return, which is ultimately good for foreign investors sitting in Luxembourg or the US or wherever you might be, because you're gonna have more choice of companies. And as I said, these companies will really reward minority shareholders. Like we've seen the growing trend with Japan, many Chinese actual state-owned enterprises have been going down the same trend. So again, while sentiment is very negative still, valuations are looking incredibly cheap, we still think there are a lot of opportunities that foreigners maybe might come back to next year. Okay, but before we get to the companies or the categories of assets that uh, you see investors piling their money still into, let me just wrap up this part of our discussion by asking, um, there is this narrative that uh, a lot of the downturn is probably due to the, the bigger discussion around geopolitics, around decoupling or de-risking. Um, if I listen to you, if I read some of the articles, um, it clearly appears that the real factors are rather growth, whether it is the absence of growth in China and growth in other Asian markets, such as, as you mentioned, uh, Korea, India, Vietnam, or uh, others. Um, is it, can we then put to rest the narrative that uh, decoupling and geopolitics is driving this? I think it's overall sentiment, so the slowing economic growth that we saw, as well as geopolitics. When it comes to geopolitics, though, and again, as we've been sort of highlighting or discussing already, 
you're going to have this very competitive relationship, especially between the two largest economies in the world, so the US and China. So China's made no secret of climbing up the value chain in terms of manufacturing prowess. In fact, for many years, it's almost been rejecting low-end FDI, which has gone to places like, for example, in ASEAN or in India. And then when you couple this with China's sort of foreign policy in terms of the Belt Road Initiative, so funding a lot of projects, especially in what we now call the Global South, you can see, unfortunately, this sort of decoupling arise. But, you know, as again, Frederick just mentioned, China needs um, the other parts of the world, especially from whether it's an export perspective, a consumer perspective. And one thing trend we've seen this year is, in fact, Chinese companies having a domestic customer base and also using their supply chain, potentially the R&B movement, to create international customers as well. Okay. Now let's get to the point uh, that we started uh, before on uh, the companies in China that you see uh, investments going into. What are the categories of assets that still are attracting foreign investments, uh, portfolio investments in particular? From an equities perspective, it's, it's definitely been AI, EV. At the start of 2024, the reopening themes so coming out of lockdown when it came, came to sort of the recovery there. I would caution against being involved in those highly momentum driven sectors or industries, because often you know, the fundamentals or the barriers of entry might not be as valid. And I think also going ahead or, or looking forward when it comes to China, the way we used to make money out of China, so by holding a few names and let's say a couple of sectors, I don't think it's going to be as easy. So I think you have to be really focused on being contrarian and essentially just owning good companies run by good and honest management teams with a margin of safety. So by that, I mean a good price. And again, across so many industries, you're finding a number of very, very attractive opportunities. Frederick, what is your take on this? Are you, uh, do you agree with uh, Catherine? It seems quite obvious that everything around tech and in particular solo or AI are uh, really the sectors where most money flows into. What about consumer companies? That's right. There's, I think, two two points to make about investing uh, in China. One is um, you, you can still take advantage of some of the long-term trends, for example, uh, that we still have an aging population, for example. Demand for health care is going to go up. Uh, consumer service is still a growing area. The consumer is becoming more sophisticated in China. More, more, more discretionary spending is being unleashed. So these are some of the long-term trends, I think, that we can uh, still focus on. Um, and, and maybe not, maybe be, be, be more cautious about sort of the very momentum driven speculative issues around AI, for example. Um, the second point to make is that uh, the Chinese market is very, very large. It's a very deep market. You have very good uh, companies there. And, and, and as we call it, it's a, it's a market where you can generate alpha. That is, you can make your homework. You can look at different individual companies um, and, and really pick up uh, sort of the new winners, the companies that will have, have much bigger growth in the market itself. But that requires knowledge of the market itself. It's not about in pure index investing. It's about actually digging deep and, and, and finding those future winners. And that's, that's where the homework comes from. And you need partners on the ground with which to do that very often. And do you find the relevant data on these companies? My experience uh, uh, during my time in China, but that's already quite outdated, was that it was difficult to get actually data on uh, companies. Yeah, it, it, it is. A, data is a challenge. Actually, as an economist, I struggle with getting macro data. Uh, you know, we always wish for better data, but I do think um, there is a lot of information in China. And what matters is to have really expertise on the ground. Uh, so a lot of our global partners like to work with uh, partners that have uh, expertise in China or at least in Hong Kong to be closer to the market is not necessarily something you do from your basement uh, in New Jersey to, to pick chocks, uh, stocks in China. You probably need to have your ear close to the ground, but I think then it it's can be a very rewarding market. Okay. The Chinese government uh, over the course of the last month uh, has been 
discussing and uh, seems to be addressing also the issues uh, around the sputtering economy. Um, do you see any reforms that may impact the, uh, the flow of investments that will help bring additional investments to China? Uh, obviously, there are the reforms uh, that will help uh, reignite the mac macroeconomy, but also reforms as in uh, the channels that uh, bring channel money into Chinese capital markets. Catherine. Yeah, I think, again, this um, sort of notion that China is going to be isolated from the rest of the world, I think that's a little bit overblown. So even from a business perspective, they are trying to put in place policies to attract foreign businesses. I think whether it was 10 years ago or in 20 years' time, when it comes to investing in China or even doing business in China, you have to be very mindful of this policy line that moves up and down. And you can't be too far away from it because you might not reap the rewards. So, for example, biotech companies are getting a lot of policy support at the moment and over the past couple of years. But you also don't want to cross it, um, which we have seen over the years in terms of regulatory regulation and, and, and changes. So in terms of attracting that capital, it's still very much there. But I go back to my earlier point about the rising importance, not just of the domestic consumer, but of the domestic investor. And especially as we've seen property, and it's, it's now known that property is not going to be the backbone or the sole backbone of the economy. We need to see diversification. We need to see diversification of the household balance sheet. So potentially a Chinese balance sheet at home looks more like, let's say, a balance sheet in Europe. And so the development of Chinese capital markets is really, really crucial. And I go back to that point again, where Chinese corporates, in terms of disclosure and data, they really, at the pace at which they're doing it in terms of improving, is quite vast and, and very quick. And as I said, more research is going to come out, more data will be av available, and this will benefit not just domestic investors, but also international investors. And again, unless you think China is not going to be one of the biggest economies in the world, um, then at this juncture, you can see why the companies, you know, that trend I mentioned in terms of really focusing on cash flows, returning um, sort of uh, dividend yields and dividend policies, attracting overseas companies, that's real. And, and it's very, very tangible, not just in certain sectors, but we see it across the board in smaller companies, larger companies, SOEs versus private companies. Okay. Frederick, how do you see the reforms? Are they going in the right direction to uh, stimulate the economy? What more would uh, you recommend the Chinese government to do? Well, let me say there's two parts. One is the reforms or stimulate, stimulus uh, policies that we need to get the economy growing again. And, and here we've seen a success of measures, uh, even the last few months, more fiscal stimulus, for example, more support for developers in the real estate market, for example. Uh, we see more liquidity injections by the central bank. Each sort of incremental measures to get the economy really to a point where it's more stable, where it's growing uh, kind of at a decent clip. What they're not trying to do is overstimulate the economy so we have a boom and then bust again. There's really deliberate choice here to get us at a speed of growth that's sustainable. Um, unfortunately, investors are sometimes impatient and they ask for a bigger stimulus, but really the idea is to have a gradual implementation of this. And I think once we get the realization that that really means more sustainable, if slightly slower growth, I think then we'll be rewarded. I think that you asked the questions in terms of flow channels, is there massive reforms? Um, there's no not been a big blockbuster reform in opening new channels for, for foreign investors to access. Really, I think the focus has been on better implementation to improve the market mechanics of the market itself. For example, the improvement of the, the equity market, uh, re revising the IPO pipeline in China to manage more the liquidity in the market itself, to help the market itself function better with the hope that indirectly would then uh, bring back foreign portfolio investors. Uh, same on FDI. It's not that they massively open new sectors. It's just that really they want to address micro-regulations uh, to improve the implementation of the foreign investment framework for companies there. So, so on the inflow side, it's much more micro uh, focus. But really, we need more, we need better growth expectations to bring flows in, and that, that's going to take a while. Okay. Catherine, on the investment channels, um, I suppose today still it's the Stock Connect that is the one where most investments flow through. Is that so? 
It is indeed. Um, and in terms of just the broader capital markets, I mean, the Chinese government bond market has been one of the best performing fixed interest markets uh, globally over the past two years. In China itself, you see domestic investors really gravitating towards a product called fixed income plus, which essentially is around about 70 percent fixed income and then 30 percent equities. But in terms of attracting that uh, sort of the foreign investor back into the market, it's about seeing confidence improve. And, and Frederick highlighted it very well. You know, it's 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 about being impatient. And, you know, when you look at the Chinese policymakers and full disclosure, I'm a bull when it comes to China. But if you read the bare side of the equation or the argument, everything that China was doing in terms of its growth model that was unsustainable in the bear's eyes, it changed when it comes to infrastructure predominantly and property. But it seems that every time even something positive is done policy-wise, it's it's sort of not perceived like that from the international point of view. So I think it's about, again, resetting of expectations. Expectations. China doesn't want to grow at 9, 10% anymore. It wants to deliver moderate, sustainable, long-term, attractive growth. And again, that is what we need to sort of reset our expectations when it comes to policy and not be disappointed that we haven't seen sort of this huge policy stance like we're used to. And then also just when you look at the market returns, as I alluded to earlier, it's about having a diversified portfolio of well-run and very well-financed companies versus just holding a few momentum or, or stellar blockbuster names. Okay. Both your firms, Fidelity and HSBC, are obviously very well, uh, are very active in the Chinese market itself. You have uh, Fidelity set up a wholly owned foreign uh, entity re recently to uh, tap the Chinese market. HSBC, nobody uh, ignores this, is a very actively local bank. And you have also acquired Cities uh, Wealth Management uh, activities in China. So is that part of a play by both your firms to become more active in the domestic market, serving the local uh, investor base? Catherine, you referred to, uh, once or twice before to <clears throat> the domestic market, the local investor base. Is that something where you see when uh, Judith introduced uh, the conference this morning, she also talked about how uh, the Chinese asset management or wealth management market had grown. Is that something that you are now targeting for itself? Yeah, massive. And, and uh, you know, I, I mentioned how when you look at China through the lens of being a foreign investor, you really need to be on the ground in terms of the nuances of policy direction implementation. I'm sure when you see the growing interest from Chinese households towards international asset classes, be it equities, fixed income, et cetera, then they also want to get support from multinational asset management companies in terms of just providing those insights from more of a global perspective and you know, again, if we see pension reform really develop in China, that's going to be more money coming into the households. We've seen incomes going up, and that money really needs to find a home. It can't just sit in a deposit account. We know it can't just all get funneled into the property sector. So sort of that rise of the domestic capital markets alongside international asset classes, I think the potential is really, really vast. Okay. And Frederick, uh, obviously the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation is... <laughs> is a local player, uh, but I suppose this is also part of a strategy to uh, get a bigger foothold in the local market. That's right, and, and you're tapping essentially in some broader trends here in China that Catherine alluded to, which is that uh, this is no longer an economy that needs very rapid industrial financing, uh, certainly not uh, construction financing. This is now turning towards uh, consumer wealth management. This is a population that has very high savings, that is aging very quickly, where the, where the average household is really thinking about retirement. Um, and uh, so there is tremendous demand for wealth management products, uh, for, for you know, savings products that, that span a, a few decades. Um, and helping uh, these households invest that money for, for the future. That's, that's a growth area. Wealth is still being accumulated at tremendous pace. The household saving rate is about over 30% uh, of the income is being saved. And, and
It's no longer flowing into speculative um, ventures in the property market. It now is looking for other types of investment. And this is really where I think asset managers come in, where banks come in, and uh, we all try to tap into this, this more structural trend in, in growth in China. If I listen to both of you, I get a very reasonably optimistic picture about uh, China, its economy and its appeal to international investors. If I were to ask you, where do you see China in five years from now, um, what would you be able to tell me, Catherine? I think over the next five years, growth is still going to be very attractive and the developments of everything we've been speaking about, demographics, capital markets, is still very much intact, the consumer obviously. In terms of the next 12 months, so if we were to look at the five years and 12 years or short, medium, long term, I think what we really do need to see is a pickup in earnings and, you know, usually it's about six to nine months ahead of the trough in terms of the stock market and how it performs. And because sentiment is so bearish, because we do see these continued policies, both fiscally as well as monetary, being put into the system to really restore this growth in terms of confidence. And don't forget, it's not a financial crisis we've seen in China. Frederick just highlighted the household savings rates. It's more about, if you wanted to call it a crisis, a crisis in confidence. So we need to see these policies in terms of promoting growth, sustainable, modest growth, continue. But over the longer term, I think that the Chinese economy and the market will continue to deliver. Nothing, obviously, in a straight line, but it will continue to look very attractive. And the earnings will actually come through starting from next year. And the, confidence, uh, the crisis of confidence, is that also among international investors? Definitely. I think that the international investors are really driving it in terms of this lack of confidence. I'm not saying the domestic investor hasn't been a little bit cautious this year. But if we look at those southbound um, sort of the, the flows, like 40 billion US, which supersedes the inflows foreign-wise into Japan, which has been such a well-loved market this year, you know, I think we can't underestimate, again, I keep going back to it, but the growing influence of the domestic investor alongside the domestic consumer and how this impacts, you know, whether it's foreign consumer-related companies or indeed foreign capital markets and flows going both ways. Good, thank you. Frederick, where do you see China in five years uh, from now? Well, I think our message would be, of course, there are some trends that will mean possibly lower trend growth for China. But the message is don't fear even if China's economy grows at 4% in, in five years' time instead of 5 or 6%. Even if it's 3.5% growth, it's not the end of the world. We should start thinking of China not in terms of one headline growth number that determines everything, but think of uh, this is a vast economy with different sectors that would do very well, other sectors that would lag behind, certain coastal regions that would do extremely well, others that would lag behind. So that uh, after so many years of growth, we're just so accustomed to look at the headline number and think that that determines everything. Open up the box. There's going to be demand for consumer service is going to grow faster than GDP. The high tech sector is going to grow faster than GDP and other sectors will fall behind, like construction, for example. That's part of a natural transition. But we don't buy the U.S. economy uh, stocks because the economy is growing two and a half or three percent. We're growing different. We're buying different sectors in the U.S. We should think about like that in China as well. It's about different sectors. It's about different companies. It's about you know some parts grow faster than others. That's really what the future holds. And so weaker growth is just a natural uh, consequence of an economy is becoming richer and richer. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this brings us to the end of our panel discussion. Um, I think it has certainly helped us uh, clarify a number of points around the Chinese economy and, and the way investors are and should be looking at it. And uh, if I may paraphrase what Frederick has said, it's more about individual sectors than about the country and it, its economy as a whole. Uh, so let us take stock maybe in 12 months where we are and uh, see how it has evolved. Catherine Young from Fidelity International, Frederick Newman from HSBC, thank you very much and hope to see you in Hong Kong uh, soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And 
And I pick it up here, Nicola. Thank you very much. That leads us nicely to our next segment. But I shall see you later for our second panel session, which then will address what those Chinese investors are looking for when they want to invest in global markets. But now we're going to drill more deeply into this vast economy and very deep economy that uh, Frederick was just describing with a focus on China's digital economy. As we know, China's big tech and fintech have been vital for the transformation of China's economy into a digital economy. They are contributors of job creation, of growth and indeed innovation. And just to give you a bit of a scale of what we're talking about here, when uh, Jörg earlier mentioned this is truly a fitness club for development of innovation and upgrade of age products with um, a very demanding customer base and a very entrepreneurial mindset. So we're talking um, about a digital economy in China that has reached just under $7 trillion or 41.5% of GDP, ranking second worldwide after the United States. That's according to the latest Digital China Development Report that is released every year by the Chinese Academy of Cyberspace Studies. So this is why at last year's China Finance Forum, we looked at Chinese e-commerce companies and how they are taking their business model to the international stage. So this year, we're going to focus on fintech and very specifically on Ant Group and how its digital innovation is going global. And as moderator for this conversation, I have the pleasure to welcome back to the China Finance Forum a true fintech connoisseur and familiar face for this audience, Zenon Capron, the founder and director of Capron Asia, one of Asia's leading providers of consulting for the fintech industry. Now, Zenon has more than 20 years under his belt in terms of experience in the financial services sector and he is a recognized expert on fintech in China and its impact on the financial sector. Now, before launching Capron Asia in 2007, Zenon served as director for the global banking industry at Intel and before that as CIO of Citigroup Portugal, among others. Zenon is also the co-founder of China Fintech and the author of the book Chomping at the Bitcoin, the past, present and future of Bitcoin in China. So warm welcome back to you, Zen, and good to have you with us once again. And I hand it over to you and your guest. Thank you, Judith, and thank you everyone for having me back this year. This is one of my favorite events on the calendar because we get to explore in depth the relationship between Luxembourg and China and everything that's been happening. Of course, a big part of that story is China FinTech. I remember when I first got to China in 2004, I was paying for everything in cash. By the time I left in 2018, it was all digital. But that trend hasn't just stopped at the borders of China. Indeed, some of China's tech giants, including Ant Group, have expanded internationally. Over the next 20 minutes, we'll have a chance to talk through some of this in more detail and learn more about what Ant Group is doing across the Asia Pacific region. Here with me today is Lei Ming Chen. Lei Ming is the Senior Vice President at Ant Group, responsible for international public policy, government affairs of Ant Group. Lei Ming, great to speak to you today. Maybe just to start things off, could you give us a brief intro to yourself and what you do at Ant Group? Thank you, Zerna. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be part of this uh, great event. Um, I joined Ant Group in March 2016 and served as general counsel of uh, Ant Group until July 2020 and has been responsible for Ant Group's international public policy and government affairs function since early 2021, uh, serving as the chief sustainability officer of Ant International since July 2023. Uh, I have also been leading the formulation and the implementation of Ant International's ESG sustainability strategy and initiatives. It is, it has been a, a, a very fulfilling journey for me uh, since I joined Ant Group uh, in early 2016. 
as a great starting point. And I want to get into a lot of those things as we go through this. Um, Liming, a lot of people obviously would be aware of Ant Group, but some of your recent, more recent activities, what, what has the company been involved with internationally in the different areas that you talked about with the ESG and payments and, and just general international expansion? Sure. Um, as, as our audience uh, uh, will, will know, uh, Ant Group started from Alipay, uh, which was created in 2004 as a third-party escrow service to bridge the trust gap between online buyers and the sellers in the e-commerce space. Ever since then, uh, we have been using technology to help address challenges faced by our consumers uh, and our communities. Uh, what is perhaps not as well known is our international business, uh, where our focus is on serving global merchants through digital and inclusive cross-border payments and other financial services. Uh, Ant International's two leading solutions are Alipay Plus, uh, which is a, a suite of cross-border digital payment and marketing solutions, and World First, uh, which connects SMEs around the world with fast and affordable cross-border payments and other financial services for SMEs. Uh, and puts a lot of value into how we pursue our international businesses, uh, which is uh, anchored on four T's. Let me explain what are those four T's. Uh, travel, trade, tech, and the talent. Uh, let me sort of break, uh, break down one by one. Uh, travel, uh, with Alipay Plus, uh, global travelers can pay when they travel abroad at home and feel uh, welcome anywhere they go um, when they see the blue Alipay Plus acceptance mark. We can dive deeper into that in, in a moment. Um, shop owners can do uh, international business with a, a trusted payment QR code uh, appealing to travelers beyond their borders. Uh, that connection is real and in, in, enduring, um, and we will strive to further expand uh, Alipay Plus to connect more travelers and more shops globally. That's part of the people movement. Um, second T, trade. Uh, SMEs are the bulk of international trade. Um, they are also proportionally more exposed than their larger counterparts to risks and uh, volatility. Uh, Anti International assists SMEs for global trade through World First. World First, um, we acquired World First in 2019, and its mission is to make it easy for SMEs to do business anywhere. Our online platform has empowered 1 million SMEs uh, to trade globally in multiple currencies uh, with fast, convenient uh, payment, payout and collection, and the transparent and advantageous exchange rates. The third T is tech. Obviously, we're a technology company. Um, technology is one of the two fundamental pillars that allow us to drive inclusive payment and financial services globally. Uh, the technology we have developed uh, to support our business can also support other ecosystem partners and help innovators globally. The last T, not least, um, is talent. Uh, the other fundamental pillar supporting our business is talent. Um, it is the other key ingredient in our secret sauce. Uh, through Ant Group's 10 by 1,000 tech inclusion program, uh, we have pledged to nurture at least 1,000 tech leaders uh, in emerging markets each year for at least 10 years. Uh, since its inaugural class in 2020, uh, we have trained approximately uh, 5,000 tech talents from 98 
countries and regions of which uh, 73 are in developing uh, markets representing 1,500 1, plus organizations uh, with over 80% of them using as at being SMEs and 46.9% of the trained talents are women. So it's a quite impactful. Uh, these are the four T's guiding internet and international in our voyage forward um, towards a sustainable development uh, with the power of uh, digital innovation. Uh, if you think about a car uh, on this voyage, um, travel and a trade are the two front wheels to guide us uh, to the ultimate goal, which is to contribute to a global digital economy. Uh, this is what we uh, do and uh, where we are heading to. Uh, while the latter two wheels, um, tech and the talent uh, are our driving power, um, those two back wheels um, make our journey very unique, uh, driving us towards significant contribution to an inclusive and sustainable global digital economy. That's a great overview, I mean, thanks for that. I, I mean, getting into more detail around that, uh, you, as you suggested around Alipay Plus, can you tell us a little bit more about that product? And I know that um, Ant Group has had an international footprint, especially here in Southeast Asia, where I'm based for a number of years. What makes Alipay different, or Alipay Plus rather different? Sure. Yeah, that's a that's a great story. When looking back, and and I think uh, when when I joined in 2016, uh, we had a little bit of a cross border offline payments um, in uh, outside of China, and over the past four or five years, really, we have um, driving uh, our international business very, very significantly through Alipay Plus. Um, in 2013, um, specifically um, through Alipay, Ant Group started serving outbound Chinese travelers. Uh, since then, uh, we have gradually expanded our global partnerships to create an open, win-win uh, global digital inclusive ecosystem. Uh, with the sharing and uh, up upgrading of our cutting edge mobile payment technology, we strive to enhance cross-border payment experience for Chinese users while also helping uh, Asian uh, players tackle cross-border uh, payment challenges. Uh, we also provide solutions to help Chinese merchants operate faster and better in overseas markets. Uh, and at the same time, enable global merchants to access multiple digital payment methods and uh, connect with the local uh, consumers through one-time integrations. Uh, by connecting uh, the world through technology, we aim to transform and up, upgrade uh, local uh, digitalization in communities we serve. Uh, we were ultimately enabling global consumers to pay with their home e-wallet whenever they see Alipay Plus. Uh, Alipay Plus was launched uh, at the inclusion conference in Shanghai in uh, 2020 um, and has since connected to more than uh, 20 digital payment methods, including e-wallets, uh, banking APPs, and buy now, pay later uh, players, uh, covering global consumers, especially in Southeast Asia, uh, and the tens of millions of uh, uh, online and offline uh, merchants around the world. Uh, our key online merchants uh, come from uh, sectors uh, favored by global uh, mobile savvy users, uh, including digital entertainment, uh, e-commerce, tourism, and online to offline uh, O2O 2 players, uh, such as uh, Apple, uh, Disney Plus, MBA, uh, Amazon, Agoda, uh, to name a few. Um, also, offline merchants uh, covered by Alipay Plus span from a key um, Asian and uh, 
European markets in sectors like uh, food and beverage, uh, tourism, uh, hospitality, uh, retail, and uh, uh, transportation, uh, such as um, uh, Universal Studio in Japan, uh, various duty-free shops in South Korea, um, uh, print temps in France, and uh, Milan uh, Domo Cathedral in Italy. Uh, so we certainly hope Luxembourg is next. I think they probably do too. Uh, just getting into uh, the Alipay Plus footprint is so large. Who would be the main competitors for you in Southeast Asia and globally? Are there any? Uh, when we look at some of our partners and the digital e-wallets we invest in um, Southeast Asia uh, over the past seven to uh, eight years, um, uh, you know, I think uh, they can be very proud of the progress uh, they have accomplished uh, in becoming leading providers of uh, inclusive uh, digital payments in their home markets. Um, now, what the body we bring to the table really is the technology enabling easy, safe, convenient cross-border payments. So we, in, 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 in the local markets, we work with our e-wallet partners. Um, so because we believe, um, you know, you, you will find uh, there's a lot of uh, continuity as many of the digital uh, wallets uh, we invested in over the, over the years uh, have now become partners of uh, Alipay Plus. Uh, because the, the, the values uh, uh, we bring to the table is aligned with their growth stories. Uh, what I believe uh, is different with Alipay Plus uh, is that we are looking at an inclusive ecosystem that makes um, cross-border payments as seamlessly uh, as domestic payments. Uh, a growing uh, variety of uh, mobile uh, payment providers uh, are joining this ecosystem uh, of cross-border digital commerce uh, from uh, mobile uh, wallets uh, to banking APPs, uh, independent uh, merchant APPs and super apps. Um, as we have said in, in the past, uh, we will invest fast, faster and deeper in payment and the digital uh, marketing technology to help our partners and uh, merchant uh, merchants achieve uh, robust omnichannel growth. That's the value we believe we can bring to the table for our partners uh, and the merchants so that create a win-win situation for, for everyone. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, the consumer side is one thing, but then the business to business side is the other. And you talked about World First. I think it's been about five years since Ant acquired World First. Can you tell me how, can you tell us how uh, World Fit First fits into Ant Group strategy currently and going forward in the future. Yeah, World First. I mean, I think uh, over the past couple of years, uh, World has World First. We we have done a lot of integration with the uh, World First. Uh, World First was founded in two thousand four in in the UK. Uh, it was established to help small and medium sized businesses to overcome the um, complexity and uh, high fee associated with the cross-border uh, forex transfers and international payments. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we acquired World First uh, in 2019, um, and World First has since evolved into a global fintech uh, that connects business around the world with uh, fast and affordable uh, payments and uh, access to international markets, uh, flexible currency risk management tools, um, working capital management, and, uh, and more. Uh, our focus has uh, remained quite a, uh, constant uh, to make it easy to do business anywhere for SMEs um, active in international trade. That's great. The the I mean, with the the B two B side of things, I think especially when you look at Southeast Asia, those are really critical pain points, especially for the SMEs as you talked about, and and alleviating that that um, challenge is very important for the region and indeed the growth, especially when you look at SMEs being such a large part of the economies down here. Um, 
One of the things you mentioned um, before as we were going through was ESG, I mean, and so I know about Ant Group's footprint around ESG in China with, you know, Ant Forest and the initiatives over the years domestically. But what about the international footprint? I mean, as the chief sustainability officer for the international business, what 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 is kind of Ant Group's philosophy? And then tactically, what are you doing on the ground to kind of push sustainability in your international business? Thanks, Aaron. It's a great, great, great question. Um, as, as I mentioned, I, I um, assumed that this role of uh, and responsibility of chief uh, sustainability officer for Anti International a few months ago. Uh, but but that that's a, a topic that uh, we have always been very much focused on um, at a, at the group level. Uh, we formulate that very uh, holistic. Um, ESG sustainability strategy in the past couple of years. Um, now, internationally, uh, as climate change has become a major challenge faced by the world uh, today, uh, achieving common achieving common development uh, in green transformation has become an important task uh, for the world. Um, and uh, you know, very naturally, and group has uh, uh, captured the need to address this challenge. And in March 2021, um, and group put forward its own carbon neutrality goal, uh, which was followed by a carbon neutrality roadmap released uh, in April 2022. Uh, we, we committed to achieving uh, operation wide um, carbon neutrality from 2021 onwards. Uh, and achieving net zero emission by uh, 2030. Um, and Group was the first uh, Chinese internet national comp internet company to set such a goal. Uh, and our approach to address climate changes is, um, as you could imagine, uh, driven by technology. Um, to be more specific on what we are doing on technology, um, in support of uh, sustainable outcome, uh, I would like to share two cases. The first one is um, a gamified um, participatory uh, communications program you mentioned, uh, and Forest, uh, embedded in um, Alipay APP. Uh, since in its introduction in 2016, when I first joined um, uh, Ant Group, uh, Ant Forest has encouraged um, over 650 million uh, online users to live a low carbon life uh, through environmentally friendly behaviors, day-to-day -day behaviors, uh, including reducing paper uh, and plastic usage, uh, using greener modes of uh, uh, transportation um, and the recycling service, et cetera. Uh, through Ant Forest, uh, our um, Ant uh, Alipay users green footprint is converted into a life uh, style practice and planting over 450 million trees um, over the past uh, eight years um, since it was launched. Very impactful. Uh, a total of uh, 24, and in addition to the trees, we have planted a total of uh, 24 protected areas have been established with uh, the support of uh, environmental organizations uh, protecting more than 1,600 species of uh, uh, wildlife. Um, furthermore, through the launch of the fantastic, fantastic species we're seeing and forest uh, mini program, we um, offer education inter interactions uh, on over 200 uh, endangered species and attracted a total of over 140 million users uh, to participate in learning about uh, biodiversity. Um, another case um, is our Carbon Matrix, uh, a software as a service product uh, to help businesses manage their carbon impact throughout the full carbon uh, life cycle. Um, powered by blockchain technology, a Carbon Matrix not only provides a one-stop solution uh, by aggregating and visualizing companies' uh, carbon data, but also enable uh, third-party environmental institutions to 
conducted temper-free audits and certify carbon neutrality activities, making it easier for SMEs to access green finance financing opportunities. Uh, so on the international front, uh, we're still at the beginning of our journey, as I mentioned, uh, and yet the level of uh, ambition is just uh, high uh, with uh, our group company. Uh, we uh, certainly, uh, we recently uh, launched uh, our Ant International Foundation. Uh, we're focusing on three areas uh, through this foundation, uh, environmental and ocean protection, uh, tech and digital inclusion, uh, and uh, the talent development, such as the 10 by 1000 tech inclusion program. Uh, let's meet again in a few months time um, when I will be able to share more about uh, uh, the exciting projects uh, we're doing at Ant International Foundation. Yeah, it's amazing. You've, you've only been in the role a couple of months, but you have so many stories to tell already. I'll be really impressed in a couple of months later and see, see, see how much it has been. I mean, this has been great. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So I just want to kind of close off with one last question before we we finish this uh, segment is, you know, when we come back for the China Finance Forum 2024, what will have surprised us about the development of fintech in China internationally? What, what do you think will have changed dramatically that, that people maybe aren't expecting? Great question. Um, I, I um... I believe that uh, business strategies and sustain sustainability strategies will have become uh, intertwined uh, for the tech industry, fintech industry. Uh, at least I know this is the road we're taking. Um, at Ant International, um, we don't think about business and sustainability strategies separately. Uh, our business uh, by its nature uh, and from the beginning of our establishment uh, has always been focused on the needs of our consumers and partners, uh, gradually expanding our digital solution offerings to bring more inclusive and sustainable changes to serve the underserved globally, uh, to make it easier to do business everywhere and to bring small and beautiful changes to the world is what we truly believe and we're doing. Um, so. I, I think, uh, you know, in, in a year's time, we will see more of the converge, convergence of the uh, you know, business value with sustainability value. Um, and, uh, you know, business strategy will be totally driven by in consideration with the sustainability strategy. So that's all about using technology innovation to solve society's real problems. Very true. And it may be that technology indeed is the solution for all of these. Let me thank you so much. This was an incredible, uh, very brief, but very informative session. Uh, really enjoyed talking with you today. Um, and, and so for everyone, I'm sure there will be details about how to stay in touch with Leming in the future. But thank you again for your time, Leming. Thank you, Zeno. Pleasure. Great. And Judith, hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Zenon Capron and Leming Chen from Ant Group. And I hope you now get a better understanding what Jörg meant earlier when he said uh, this is China. China, the Chinese market is actually a fitness club for the development of innovation and upgrading products that may be may have come of age in, in, in the established economies in, in Western countries. So I definitely could see uh, what Leiming Chen just described, the Ant Forest, a gamified tool, a learning tool uh, for consumers to change their lifestyle towards more sustainability. And then the carbon matrix using blockchain to create more transparency for those M&Es that will struggle to get better data on their, on their life, on their product life cycle to, to reduce their carbon footprint and then get 
get easier access to green finance. I could see that definitely as an inspiration also for financial services companies in other parts of the world. This, though, takes us nicely, having listened to now at, to Ant Group's global expansion strategy, to what Chinese investors may be looking for when they look to invest in the global markets. And so I'm delighted to hand it back over to Nicola and his panel. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be back after initially uh, earlier discussing the way that international investors are looking at the Chinese market. What we're going to do now is to look at how Chinese investors and Chinese asset management firms are looking at uh, the markets abroad, um, but from two dimensions. First of all, their investments abroad, but then also uh, the way that they raise capital abroad to invest it back into China. And to do this, I have a stellar panel of experts uh, with Shengzhu Wang, who is the managing director and global head of asset management at Haitong International Securities, based in Hong Kong. Uh, Ning Lin, managing director of CICC Hong Kong uh, Asset Management. And uh, Bing Fan, who is senior portfolio manager and head of international index strategies at eFund Management. Gentlemen, now... We have an all-male panel that is, of course, not ideal. We always strive to also have gender balance in our panels. But for this particular panel, uh, it, was, it was proving to be difficult. We uh, certainly ha are happy that overall we think we have struck a good balance between male and female speakers. So um, apologies if we haven't managed it here. But I think that uh, on the substance, we are very happy to have these uh, three foremost experts with us today. As I said, we would be looking at uh, two dimensions mentions of the uh, issue, uh, outbound investments, where do Chinese investors uh, look at, and then also where do they raise capital to invest back into China. Now, uh, when we say where do they look at, we obviously first of all think of which geographic markets. Um, is it Asia? Is it the US? Is it Europe? And then obviously each of these markets has uh, its appeals, its challenges, but who wants to start? Shengzhou, maybe if you could uh, frame it a little bit, how you go about uh, the global market and where you see your clients uh, currently preferring their money to go to. Right. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, it's my pleasure to join the panel and also the, the China Forum. This, uh, this afternoon. Um, so since the opening of the question, I think all the panelists, including myself, we are sitting in Hong Kong, uh, which served as a gateway for both China southbound and the northbound flows, including you know, in investors diversifying into the rest of the world and helping them uh, you know, uh, raise capital outside and then invest back to China. So for outbound flows, um, as we are, like Mr. Ling, we are uh, Chinese investment banks. Uh, in, within the investment bank, we are the asset managers to help both uh, institutional and the corporate clients. Uh, so similar to our finance role in the previous panel, which they facing mainly retail investors, but I think the investor type are different. However, the, the mandate or the objective of the current trend under the, this high interest, high interest rate, high inflation environment are quite similar, is that the Chinese investors are looking for relatively higher return and also safety assets, given the high interest rate differential in, in the US market and also in Europe. So what they typically uh, look for, for example, advanced market equities, and also uh, relatively high saving rate CDs or more safety assets like treasury, US treasury or other sovereign bonds. 
given the current high interest rate environment. So that's a very short summary of what institutional investors are interested at this moment. Okay. And uh, the others, Ninglin, maybe, uh, is that the same view from the point of view of CICC? Certainly, I would certainly uh, agree with uh, uh, Dr. Wang. Yeah, but take a step back. Uh, Nicolas, uh, thank you very much for having me. It's great to, to be on this uh, panel. Uh, last year, I was in the uh, Sino-Swiss Forum, and this year, I'm very pleased to be on the Luxembourg for Finance Forum here. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Bing Fan, any... I suppose you, you, you agree with the two previous speakers. If we can then dig a little bit deeper, uh, Sheng Zhu Wang has said that institutional investors are looking more for sovereign bonds. Uh, if you look at more on the equity side, is there a particular asset or sector rather uh, that you uh, are looking for? When we discussed this previous in the previous panel um, for China inbound, it was obvious that. Uh, <clears throat> it's the tech sector, and in particular, everything around AI or EVs or solar in general uh, that is attracting investments. Is the same holding true when it is about Chinese investments abroad? Are they also looking to invest mainly into tech uh, and in particular AI? Or are they also looking into other sectors like health or consumer or real estate abroad? Thank you, Nick. Uh, I mean, I definitely echo what my fellow panelists has been shared about the uh, investing overseas. In general, my conversation with the institutional investor is typically when they are uh, allocating assets globally, they're trying to be a growth player. So basically, they're looking for the sectors can deliver a long run return higher than the uh, average GDP growth. So in the technology sector in the globe is definitely one of the hot area has been focused by China institutional investors. Also geographically wise, uh, typically when the people investing overseas, it depends on how familiar the, they, 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 they are with the underlying assets. So typically the first stop for them will be the Hong Kong markets because it's a such a, such a such a short distance. Then the second destination will be US because of the impact on the global system. Then after that, uh, recently, investors also pay attention to Japan markets, uh, Indian markets, and also the Europe markets as well. Okay, so Asian markets come after the US market, if I understand you correctly. I'll say from the money movement, the Hong Kong market is actually coming first. No, no, of no, course. Hong Kong, Hong Kong is always first because as the exit uh, gate, uh, it, it would make sense. But beyond Hong Kong in Asia, uh, you mentioned Japan, you mentioned India. Uh, these markets, if I understand correctly, would come after the United States, for instance. So you, you, you expect higher returns or safer placements, safer investments in the US uh, than in other Asian markets. Interesting. Yeah, I thought that... Um, okay, I thought that uh, Chinese investors were uh, preferring to invest closer to home in Asian markets uh, before going really overseas. Is that not what you are seeing? I mean, home bias is just one, one factor, but also the familiarity with the, uh, with the markets and also the listing company is another factor to consider. Okay. Maybe I can add something, Nicola, here. I think the Chinese investors have been long invested in the Euro European Bank 81s. They are fam very familiar with this sector. Yeah, Europe is probably uh, lagging behind. Well, well, we're trying, we're trying to to promote European investments. You know, I guess that's what, what our panel is about as well. Uh, as I said, I mean, my investors have been looking at the eighty one European eighty ones for for a very long time in the past few years, which provides a very good return. Of course, we got this uh, Credit Suisse thing, but but these days, I mean, since last week, 
when 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 UBS issue the new eighty one, right? The whole market got your price coming back. I think going forward, it will still be a very good, uh, good, uh, good, good one. Let, that's and, just one example, right? And, and besides. Besides the fixed income, what about equities in Europe versus Asia or versus the US? How are you looking at this? Obviously, there's a growth story behind, and you look at the differentials, I would suppose. No, no uh, I mean, that's a very good question. I mean, the European stocks, right, has been somewhat uh, overlooked or underway, I would say. I mean, people will look at the big tech names in the US and big tech names in in China, as previous panel uh, pointed out. But I think in Europe, well, we're doing a few things in Europe, right? I mean, uh, well, we've been uh, actually, as I said, promoting uh, the European investments uh, to, to our investors. We've been actually having a strategic partnership with uh, European asset manager. I think I can, I can, I can name them. I think it's not another secret. It's a, a uh, Edmund Darrow's tried uh, as a management company, right? We have a good relationship with them. We are actually bringing one of their less simple funds to our shelf here in, 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 in Hong Kong, uh, which is a global big data uh, strategy fund. It's actually performing very well. Of course, it has a, a North American uh, exposure, but it does have a big chunk in the European uh, tax sector as well. So we're promoting this fund here uh, for investors, both retail as well as the institutions. Yeah, if you look at the US uh, S&P 500 and you look at uh, the equivalents in Europe, uh, there were a couple of articles in the FT earlier in the summer in The Economist uh, only a week or two ago that said if you take out the seven big tech firms and the big tech um, names, actually the US market has underperformed the European uh, market. Now, obviously, others will be saying that it doesn't make sense to take out the seven big U.S. tech firms because they are the U.S. market. Uh, but other than that, the point, my point is that actually maybe Europe isn't doing so badly if it weren't for the fact that the U.S. has these seven big tech firms. So maybe something to reconsider. Shengzhou, do you want to weigh in on uh, this particular point of where your investors are looking at which which sort of uh, which geographic market, which uh, sort of uh, sectors. Right, I think uh, uh, the Chinese investors actually it's it's more familiar than you expect with the U.S. market in the past because the the technology sector, uh, which, which in the past China's technology sector was trying to mimic what the U.S. high tech companies was doing from the Silicon Valley. Uh, so I think naturally they have a quite strong focus and the interest in the tech sector. And also given the performance of, for example, on NASDAQ overall compared to other uh, indexes. So there's a natural interest for Chinese, uh, both corporate and institutional investors. And also even for the high beta or the cyclical sectors like financials, uh, again, given the very high interest rate and uh, the rate hike environment, it's uh, beneficial to the U.S. financial sectors or the U.S. banks going to be on historical revenue, high revenue this year after 2021. So uh, even with a relatively uh, higher beta or even higher valuation compared to the Chinese financial sector, for example, Chinese banks, the, the, these Chinese investors, they're also very keen for the for the cyclical ones or the even the defensive ones for the broad index of the U U.S. equities and the, given the global weight of U.S. in the MSCI world index is naturally they allocate more to the U.S. market, uh, you know, more than Europe or Japan. Okay, if we turn now to your 
other activity, which is that of raising capital abroad and investing it into China. Um, you probably have heard Frederick and Catherine Young talk about the challenges of doing that. Um, the same, I suppose, holds true for you. But if you position yourselves vis-à-vis -vis to uh, international uh, investors, in particular institutional ones, what is the uh, what is the way that you sell yourself? What is your added value to these international investors who want to get uh, China exposure? Okay, I will start first, yeah. and uh, my my uh, fellow panelists can can jump in anytime. So, as a, as a Chinese asset manager, based in Hong Kong. Uh, we you, in the past we focused on U.S. dollar denominated assets or Hong Kong dollar denominated assets. Um, given the nature and uh, and also the source of these funds, um, there, there's an interesting trend in uh, in the last 12 to 18 months that we have is that we see more offshore renminbi denominated uh, assets available and also. These asset owners, they have increasingly holding of the offshore renminbi due to the rising trade settlement or transactions or trade with, with China uh, entities. So they look for a comparable yield compared with the offshore renminbi with the onshore ones instead of um, I'm requiring a higher return in the US dollar terms. No, they don't because they want to keep that exposure and because of the other purpose, for example, trade uh, trade settlement or credit. So as a Chinese asset manager, um, in general, I think we have a competitive advantage in raising offshore renminbi denominated funds or products and in, in, invest back to China to look for uh, you know, onshore fixed income or equity portfolios to to yield returns through the so-called RQV or QV channel. So this is a, a rising trend that we observe. Thank you. Uh, Ning Lin, do you want to come in? Yeah, sure. I mean, two things very quickly. One is that uh, I was speaking at the uh, EQ Derivatives Forum uh, in September in Singapore. That was uh, that was uh, a, a big uh, international one. So what I share with the uh, international investor was that if you first look at uh, the inflows uh, into the uh, the public markets of China onshore, right, uh, BF, QV, RQV, as uh, Dr. Wang uh, mentioned, uh, the number this year is actually a big plus number. Uh, so, so as uh, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, at that point, it was up like a 32 billion uh, inflow this year. And put into historical perspective, you, if, if you just look at that number, right, the lowest in the past few years was like 2016, that was 9 billion US the whole year, okay? And guess what? After that, that was a huge bull market, bull run since then. Okay, that's, that was one point. Another, another point being like, let, uh, you know, Nicola, you asked oh, what, what value can we add, right? There, there are many, many things there. I have European investors looking at small to medium size company investments, right, in, in, in China Asia. There are some like 4,000 uh, 4, stocks out of which they are interested in the small and medium size ones. And that needs a lot of liquidities and that has a huge growth uh, potential as well. Another thing, is that uh, obviously quantitative uh, methodology these days, I think, I'm sure, you know, <laughs> Bing can, uh, can, can mention more. It, it's rarely a rising trend in China. So, so uh, if, if, if you know, uh, since third quarter of 2021, uh, in Asia at least, uh, actually the, the quant methodology is uh, outperformed the, the, the traditional bottom-up stock picking ones. Uh, if you may. So uh, that, that, that's a quick point I was to premier this morning. Good. And Bing Fan, maybe from the point of view of uh, e-fund management. Sure. So for e-fund, we are one of the uh, major uh, asset managers in China. Uh, with a good gender diversity, by the way, Nicholas. <laughs> so for us, we are, we are very committed to China's story. So from a bigger picture, our role is actually trying to telling a good China story in a smart and wise way. 
So we understand investing in any geographic countries, it will have the rotation timing and the seasonalities. And we understand there's also concerns from institutional investors on the challenges facing faced by, uh, by, China, by China markets. So our job is also how we can add value is we sharing what really happened in the China market or sharing what's really happened on the ground. That's number one. And we definitely help organize in institutional investors globally to come into China for our investor day events. And we also, during our roadshow, share what is our take home for China policies, China earnings, and we help with our institutional investors globally to understand the uh, discount about the PE ratio, about the valuation, and about the long run, long term change or trends for China markets. And hopefully that can help with uh, policy wise, the uh, Belt and Road, also the RMB institution, uh, internationalization, and we also helping the flows both two way. You have mentioned the uh, telling the China story. Um, obviously, when you lay out this narrative and convince your investors, you probably also realize that there are differences uh, in the way that investors, depending on where they are from, look at the China story. What are the lessons that you have learned over the last couple of months between Asian institutional investors, European ones, and maybe even among European ones, uh, and US uh, uh, investors in looking at the China story? What, what is there that may be of interest to our audience? Sure, so I'll put that one shot. Uh, after the reopening this year, we do have quite a few trips to other continents. After, after three years. And we do have uh, uh, quite a number of uh, dialogue or conversations for that. I think for that one, what we can do better is number one, we, uh, we're gonna be genuinely putting ourselves in client's shoes. Understanding their point of view is from asset allocation point of view. So for, for the institutional investor globally, they have multiple uh, regional or asset classes they can invest. And so our role is trying to tell the, uh, the, the facts and leaving the decisions to our clients. That's number one. Number two is uh, any stories needs to be told in a language that can be easily accepted or understood by the audience. That's how we also uh, learning the way, how to, how to tell the story in a way that's fitable in the local markets. And for our firm, we also um, acquiring the talents globally. So we, we do have uh, employees coming from a different background. And hopefully that gonna help us diversify our talent pools when we are uh, coming to face the uh, global institutional clients. Good. And maybe Ninglin, did you have the same experience when talking to uh, investors from different places? Certainly, certainly. You, you know, we're always talk, talking about uh, sharing the, the same language, right? The same language. Uh, narrative is very, very important. And, you, you know, uh, basically, at the end of the day, there, there are two questions, right? It's one is why and one is how. You need to answer both. Uh, well, we provide solutions here. As Dr. Wang mentioned, we're sitting in Hong Kong, we're equipped with all these tools, uh, a, a knowledge base uh, to, to help people. So, so that's number one. Number two, uh, as being mentioned, right, we tell the facts, we tell the facts. And then, you know, the, the, um, the investors made their decisions. And we, 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 made, a whole, we made a whole picture there, and, and then less value there. That low, low will always be the conclusion. When I speak to uh, you, your colleagues, your peers uh, in China about uh, setting up uh, offshore products uh, and distributing them to international investors, obviously the one issue that always comes back is that of distribution. Um, how do you go about this and uh, what, what, what do you do about it in the different markets? Shengzhou, maybe if you want to take this. Yeah, I think there's always a challenge that um, we need to find good partners, uh, which 
also competitive and also which are familiar with the local market and the regulations. Um, uh, for Haitong International, I think in Europe, we have a uh, long time and good partners, for example, in the UK, we have two uses funds, uh, which uh, can uh, raise capital for European institutional in investors uh, to invest in Asia high yield and also Asia IG fixed income products. And one of them is uh, is uh, the uh, with the ESG high yield fixed income, so which which is the, the first one in the market. And so far, I think it works well. And um, of, of course, we have in different jurisdictions and also the regu regulatory requirements are very different. Uh, so that's why we need strong partnership. And we, we look for enhance our partnership with also other institutions in Europe. You're welcome, very welcome to talk, uh, talk to us in Luxembourg or in Frankfurt or in anywhere that we can have an interest, common interest. And among our audience are certainly many people working exactly on the, uh, in firms that do exactly this. So the <laughs> be careful of your inbox, uh, dear Shengzhou. Uh, but maybe Ning Li, what is your take on uh, the issue of distribution? Yes, yeah, similar. I mean, CICC Group has been in Europe for over like uh, almost, I guess, 15 years or so. But I think that's not enough. It's a huge market. And uh, in, in, in farm management business, certainly uh, we work with our our close, uh, close uh, partner, like uh, Edmund Rustride I just mentioned. Uh, also in, in Asia, we have a close uh, a partner as well, which is uh, eSpring uh, uh, Investments. We are both we are actually running uh, Luxembourg funds as advisors and, and with, uh, with the help uh, of our partners we distribute uh, the, the, the funds. There's, there's another thing I want to mention here as well. Uh, you probably know that we are actually uh, promoting European products uh, here in Hong Kong uh, via ETF format. We actually, uh, last year we actually launched on the exchange of Hong Kong an ETF investing in the European emissions. Okay, European allowance, EUAs. So and it, it's actually, a, it, I mean, we we're talking about distribution here. It, it's actually quite challenging. Uh, it's a great, it's a great topic. It's it's it, it's a great uh, market. It's a great product. But <laughs> indeed, I I mean, we we certainly look look at uh, look at uh, 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 further enhancing our distribution uh, capabilities here for European products. Okay, interesting. Bing Fan, uh, do you want to add something to? what your two colleagues have said? Sure, I totally agree what has been shared by, uh, by fellow panelists. Uh, building up the distribution platform is a very heavy business model. So that, that actually, so put in an analogy, uh, Amazon doesn't have to produce every product on the platform by, by itself. So for, for us, we're definitely looking for partnerships which can uh, do the knowledge sharing and knowledge transfer with us when coming to the penetration of uh, foreign markets so that we can focus on our advantage edge, which is knowing the Chinese market. And certainly nobody knows the Chinese market better than uh, the likes of you. Um, let me ask you, before we wrap this up, one last round of questions about what is going on in the, the area of reforms in China. Obviously, we all follow very keenly uh, the discussions of the different work conferences, but, and, and I am very sure and confident that you are involved in this. So what is it that you and your firms are advising the Chinese government to do? What is it that you can share with us and with our audience on where you think that uh, the Chinese government should really uh, tackle um, its economic predicament. Who wants to start uh, being fun, maybe? Sure, I'll say it's, it's, it's a quite a large picture on commenting on the reforms uh, policies, etc. 
But what I can say from my Let's point of view... Let's keep it to the like, asset management sector. Uh, we, we're not going to uh, solve the issues of the real estate market or... Uh, uh, ignite uh, consumption, but let's keep it to your your area. Um, what is it that you advise or would like to see the government do in these areas that you can share with us? Sure. So what I see some encouraging signs is uh, there's a couple of uh, occasions about emphasizing the importance of a continuous opening up for the capital markets which I think is a very important sign for the Chinese capital markets. When back to three to five years ago, when China A was included in MSCI, China, MSCI EM or MSCI index, uh, the whole universe, a couple of things has been laid out for further increasing the inclusion factors, such as uh, different trading calendars, uh, different settlement cycles, there's a lack of uh, uh, hedging tools or derivative tools, et cetera. I can see in the past five years, there's there's all progresses on those four parlors. So now we have more futures available. The settlement structures and the whole market mechanisms has been more opened up, which I do like to see the inspiring progress in the in the coming couple of years. Good, thank you. Ning Lin, maybe. Yes, Nicola. So first of all, I, I have to say that I, I was really impressed by today's conference. I listened to, to the talks by uh, Minister Roof, I think, and Young, and uh, everybody, I mean, everybody has a huge deep understanding of China, China's economy, etc. So I, I guess uh, there are a lot of advice from them already. Uh, from my side, I think two things. One is that uh, my firm has been obviously advising the government on a lot of uh, stuff. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, my firm has this FinTech Institute called the CGI, the CICC Global Institute, which is really like a think tank that, that's providing a lot of advice. But at my level, I personally involved in a lot of uh, uh, tactical, so to speak, uh, advice. Uh, on asset management side, including like the uh, the QDI scheme, uh, QFI scheme, you know how to improve them, how to make them like a little, uh, little bit more uh, uh, bigger, so to speak. And and on topics like uh, GBA, the Greater Bay Area, on on topics like uh, making the Hong Kong an even uh, bigger, you know, asset management center. Stuff like that, I, I can't elaborate too much here for, for the sake of time, but that's the things we'll be looking at day in and day out. But we will have exactly after us uh, my good friend, Dr. King Ao from the F Financial Services Development Council in Hong Kong, who will speak to us about the uh, GBA, the G Greater Bay Area, and what it means for the financial industry. But maybe Sheng Zhu Wang, what, uh, what is your advice to the Chinese government in, in order to spur investments? Um, I think they have done a lot in terms of a capital account liberalization. Uh, for example, you look at the uh, connections with China and Hong Kong in terms of uh, Stock Connect, Bond Connect, and also for broader overseas investors, the QFI, and for domestic investors, the, the QD, QDI and the QDLP. But I want to emphasize one thing that all of this are still quota-based system. Even for Stock Connect, the quota, the quota size has been increased. For QFI, the quota has been removed. But still, even for the Greater Bay Wealth Management Scheme, they are all quota-based systems. So our general ad advice to, to the government is basically to lower the bar or to uh, remove the quota, uh, in introduce a rule-based, registration-based, uh, cross-border flow schemes for most of the asset class to simplify and promote more cross-border flows. That would be the more technical advice. Either you enlarge the quota, like the Stock Connect, or you, you completely remove the quota, like the QFI. Mm -hmm. Well, you can still cross the river uh, stepping from stone to stone, but you should put bigger stones in it so that you get your feet less wet. Uh, so, gentlemen, thank you very, very much. Unfortunately, this is all we will have time for uh, today. There would still be many other issues that are, uh, of course, 
uh, of interest to our audience around diversification of investments and so on, but we will have to wait for another opportunity. Um, thank you very much, Sheng Zhu Wang from Haitong, Ning Lin from CICC, and Bing Fan from Ifan. Gentlemen, I hope to see you in Hong Kong. I will be there in January and look forward to uh, meeting up with you uh, on that occasion. Thank you very much. I hand back over to Judith for uh, the rest of the program. Thank you so much, Nikola, and indeed to your whole panel for also giving me the cue for our next segment, uh, which is indeed a deep dive on the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area and its appeal for foreign investors. As both Catherine and Frederick earlier said, it is really time to get to know this Chinese market more in depth and look more at the granular perspective. And this is what we're going to do now. But first up, I'd like to share a few data points with you that puts the scale of the GBA into perspective. So essentially, the GBA is a megalopolis in the Pearl River Delta in the south of of China that extends over 56 square kilometers and essentially it has been an industrial powerhouse for the whole of mainland China for the past 30 years or so. It is formed by nine key cities in Guangdong province including Guangzhou and Shenzhen plus the two special administrative zones Hong Kong and Macau. In terms of population, it is quite an affluent population of some 86 million people. That's 5% of China's overall population. And in terms of economic prowess of this region, last year the GBA generated a GDP of just over 1.9 trillion US dollars. That's 11% of China's overall GDP. And if you want to put that into an international perspective, the GBA would be right up there with the 15 economically strongest countries worldwide and compare, for example, to Canada's GDP back in 21 and even top South Korea's GDP back in 2021 as well. So to share with us more about the appeal of the GBA, I have the pleasure, as Nicola just said, to welcome to the China Finance Forum Dr. King Lon Ao, Executive Director of Hong Kong's Financial Services Development Council. Warm welcome to you, King. It's a pleasure to have you with us at the China Finance Forum. Allow me to introduce you to our audience first up. You've been serving as Executive Director with the FSDC in Hong Kong since July 2020. Before that, your roles included President of Value Partners in Hong Kong, a CEO of East Spring Investments in Hong Kong, and a CEO of BOC Hong Kong Asset Management. Uh, you also served as the Chairman of the Hong Kong Securities and Investment Institute um, in 2000 and six to 2008. And you also served as the chairman of the Hong Kong Investment Funds Association in 2004 and in 2005. And in 2008, you were awarded the Medal of Honor by the Hong Kong government. And you were also named twice CEO of the Year in Hong Kong by Asia Asset Management in 2012 and 2014. And last year, you received an honorary fellowship uh, by the Hong Kong Securities and Investment Institute. So again, a pleasure to have you with us and to have your expertise about the GBA to share with our audience. Warm welcome to you, King. So first of all, thank you, Judith, uh, for this opportunity. It's really my honor here to speak with all the audience. Uh, you made a very good introduction uh, on GBA. Uh, but what I would like to highlight that the objective of GBA um, has actually um, manifold. Well, first of all, uh, we want to develop the GBA into an international innovation and technology hub, uh, building a global competitive uh, industry, um, modern industrial system, uh, also taking forward uh, ecological conservation as ESG, uh, and very importantly for Hong Kong, 
Um, as you know, Hong Kong is a small place. We have structural issues such as limited land and limited talent pool. But now with GBA, uh, we have this one hour living circle concept uh, that will solve a lot of our housing issue as well as uh, talent supply uh, in the medium and long term. Uh, last but not least, Hong Kong being an international financial center can play a very important role in the development of Bell and Road, such as listing some of these matured products, uh, projects, so I say especially infrastructure projects uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, so yeah, it, it's very exciting. Yes, indeed. Can you explain a little bit more for those people who are not so familiar with the region, what does it mean, one hour living circle? Right, yes, um, because now we have uh, so-called this high-speed railway network uh, connecting Hong Kong with uh, the mainland. So to give you an example, to travel from the uh, Hong Kong train station to Shenzhen train station takes exactly one five, 15 minutes. Probably going through the checkpoint um, may take the same amount of time, if not longer, depending on the, uh, whether it's peak hours or not. So you can imagine, um, you know, Within an hour, you can really travel very far uh, within the GBA. That's certainly uh, um, advantageous if you want to attract talent and also, of course, uh, foreign international investors. Can you give us an idea how international financial firms should look at the GBA? Right. Okay. Um, maybe, if you don't mind, I'll um, share a bit of history uh, with you and the audience. I think Hong Kong has always been a very successful fundraising hub for mainland companies over the past three decades, right? But going forward, Hong Kong is transforming ourselves into a very different financial city, really China's international financial city. city. Um, I can name at least four new growth engines. Wealth management, we have always been very good at that, but now we are trying to develop Hong Kong into a global family office hub. In fact, just last Tuesday, we launched uh, a new academy called a Hong Kong Academy for Wealth Legacy to attract family offices from the mainland, from uh, ASEAN, Europe, Middle East, everywhere. Right? Uh, we can talk more about that later or in other, uh, occasion, on another occasion. But um, so wealth management is definitely one because, oh, before I move on, I want to share some statistics as well. Um, just a couple of months ago, Hong Kong is ranked as the city with the most high net worth individuals in the world ahead of New York. Uh, and so some prediction that Hong Kong eventually take over Switzerland as the largest uh, wealth management hub as well in a few years uh, time. So the other is um, related to sustainability. In fact, if you look at green finance, uh, all the green bond issues in Asia outside of uh, China at least one third, 35 percent to be exact, are issued uh, out of Hong Kong. Right? And we are trying to develop ourselves into a green tech hub. And that's why um, I mentioned uh, GBA, the Greater Bay Area, can provide all the talent pool that we need uh, for this you know, very ambitious drive. Um, the third growth engine um, is, again, related to technology. And there is a new science park that is being built across the boundary between Shenzhen and Hong Kong. Um, to give you an example, biomedical is uh, a key development area for Hong Kong. Within that part, scientists from Hong Kong can tap into mainland's DNA database. Just imagine 1.4 billion worth of data, uh, uh, individual DNA data. Uh, so you can imagine the potential. Uh, and last but not least, Hong Kong is already becoming a global digital asset hub. Um, I'm sure you all have heard of you know, uh, all the crypto regulations, such as uh, allowing crypto products to be traded uh, you know, uh, by retail investors subject to proper uh, guardrails, um, introduction of stable coin regulation, and also Hong the Hong Kong government is still the only government uh, that has issued tokenized green bond. That came out uh, uh, early in the year, in January. So you, you can see that we're really putting in place four different growth engines. And these are all opportunities for international firms to help, uh, help us you know, um, realize our ambitious goals. 
Now I understand, as you explain, what um, it means when I read about Hong Kong as a super connector to the whole GBA. And I, I understand that also relates to the policy innovations that have been uh, brought in that enable market access for foreign investors to mm. the GBA uh, for international players. Um, Let's talk about the, the wealth management connect that was launched, I understand, as a pilot scheme in uh, 2021 mm -hmm. and received a recent upgrade. Can you give us an idea about the key features and how it has been going so far, how it has been received? I, I know it's early days, but maybe you can give us an idea. Yes. Um, again, um, if you don't mind, I'll just um, give you a bit more uh, background information on this. You know, if you look at China, China has the highest saving ratio in the world. Um, even has come down a little bit over the years. It's still talking about 46% uh, of the, uh, the GDP. Um, and you, if you look at the cash um, in the banking system, remember just cash, it not, um, not counting assets, is roughly 1.6, 1.8 times of US GDP, a 38 trillion US dollar. Right? So these um, cash needs to invest overseas uh, in, a, uh, in the long run. And Hong Kong is really acting as a bridge between that because China still has capital control. So Hong Kong has this unique closed loop arrangement with um, the mainland regulators. That is domestic savings on the mainland can invest offshore through products in Hong Kong, but when they redeem, the money has to be repatriated back to the mainland banking system in uh, renminbi. So uh, these connect schemes, we can count the bond connect, the, the uh, stock connect, and wealth management connect is uh, the latest. And one of the latest, the idea is to allow domestic savings, to investing in retail funds, again, for the first time, Luxembourg, European domiciled retail funds can be sold to GBA retail investors through Hong Kong via this wealth management connect scheme. Uh, as you mentioned, it was introduced a couple of years ago. Uh, it was during COVID, and so um, the, the take-up rate was quite slow, and also the different regulatory uh, uh, arrangement in terms of KYC, for example. Um, so the latest um, move is for the two regulators to come up with enhancement schemes. So, so we hope that the pickup rate, you know, will 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 uh, improve. But you can imagine the potential, the amount of saving that needs to go overseas via Hong Kong. And again, good opportunities for you know, um, European managers to promote their retail funds in Hong Kong, targeting the GBA investors. And which other cross-border um, channels and innovations should um, foreign investors be aware of or uh, be looking to to make uh, to take advantage of the appeal of the GBA? Right. Yeah. Um, we we um, know the bond connect. Uh, the uh, stock connect uh, have been wor working really well. Um, last year, there was this new introduction. In fact, uh, I need to go back to July the 1st, 2022, when President Xi Jinping came down to Hong Kong for the 25th anniversary uh, of, uh, of the establishment of the uh, Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Uh, and on that day, he made this very famous statement. I hope all of you have read about it. That is, the one country, two system is good for the nation and is here to stay for the long term. That removed a lot of uncertainties about uh, the uh, future of Hong Kong as an you know, uh, independent financial center. Because now the one country system um, is here to stay. The, the PAC, uh, again, is very in, much intact. Um, and on, uh, apart from that, we have several connect schemes that came out immediately after presidency's visit. Over the past 10 years or, or, or even longer, we had to wait at least one to two years in between um, connect schemes. But after presidency's visit, we had at least three major schemes that were introduced. The swap connect I mentioned, that means for the first time, overseas investors can access derivatives, interest rate derivatives, um, in, in this case, onshore. China is you know, the, the, the third largest bond market uh, in the world already. So you can see the access to the interest rate derivatives derivative is very important. Uh, and then the other, I call it um, international stock connect, really is extension of the uh, 
existing stock for that to allow international companies to tap into mainland saving pool, providing that they have a primary listing on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So companies can have dual primary listings, uh, for example. So that is an opportunity for inter, uh, international companies. Uh, and then we, we have um, what, what I call a very important private capital connect. Being an ex-fund manager, that is very encouraging because private capital has very long-term investment horizon. And they all, all also invest in new startups, latest technologies, and so on. Um, and this, um, to cut the long story short, Hong Kong domiciled VCPE funds can now go into partnership with fund those similar funds that are domiciled in Shanghai, part of GBA, uh, and they can invest jointly onshore as well as overseas. And then there are other you know, more schemes that have announced, but I think those are the major ones that get me excited. <laughs> I, I can tell quite a dynamic development there, but there might also be challenges that foreign financial firms might face in regards to the GBA and making use of all these um, uh, innov innovative uh, changes. What might these challenges be and how can they be overcome? Yes, um, that's a very good question. Um, data, for example, um, I think uh, you know, different countries have um, you know, different um, data security rules uh, and China, um, has uh, its own uh, set of regulations. So uh, might not be very familiar to foreign firms. And that's where Hong Kong can play a key role. In fact, the Hong Kong government has set up a committee now to look at data connectivity, at least within GBA. Um, there are um, some new initiatives that uh, have been announced recently. For example, for corporates who have bank account uh, in Hong Kong as well as on the mainland. Now, um, these data uh, can be managed co collectively. Whereas in the past, it, it, they were treated as separate uh, a bank account, so you couldn't really uh, maximize your, your, your assets, uh, for example, uh, in terms of borrowing and financing. Uh, and um, it, it's not just that, but also in terms of regulations. Now, um, our regulators have partnership with uh, GBA regulators to come up with regulatory sandboxes, especially for FinTech. Um, so, again, we have quite a vibrant fintech um, community. 25% of the fintechs are actually funded by uh, expats. A lot of those are from Europe, by the way. Thank you very much, King. Our time is coming to a close now. We very much appreciate your insights on the appeal of the GBA, and I look forward to continue that conversation with you at another time. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. And King actually gave us the cue for our final conversation for this China Finance Forum, Green Finance. How can we, how can we truly harness global finance to fight the climate crisis? And let's remind ourselves that President Xi announced back in September 2020 that, and I quote, China will aim to have CO2 emissions peak before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. Now, China's efforts to mobilize capital for green development actually started earlier in 2015 when China was the first country to launch what we now call a green bond taxonomy. It was known as the Green Bond Endorsed Project Catalog. And since then, China has become a dominant player in global green finance while continuing to develop and to strengthen its own green finance ecosystem with supportive policies, as you just heard King speak about uh, in Hong Kong in relation to the GBA. Now, to find out more about uh, the, what is currently happening in China and that perspective, I have the pleasure to welcome back another familiar face for this audience of the China Finance Forum, and that is Julie Becker from the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. Now, Julie's career in the financial sector in Luxembourg spans over uh, two decades and includes positions at the Central Bank of Luxembourg and at Dexia. She joined the Luxembourg Stock Exchange in 2013 and was appointed to its executive committee in 2015, before then being named deputy CEO in 2019 and then taking the helm as CEO in in April 2021. 
Now, in 2016, Julie Becker founded the Luxembourg Green Exchange, the world's first and leading platform that's entirely dedicated to sustainability-focused securities. Julie has also represented the Luxembourg uh, Exchange, Stock Exchange, and the Luxembourg Green Exchange at many international conferences and for as an expert on sustainable finance, including the prestigious EU high-level expert a group on sustainable finance between 2016 and 2018. Uh, Julie Becker is also the chair of Lux CMA, a market capital, a market uh, capital markets association that was founded in Luxembourg back in 2019. So warm welcome to you, Julie. Good to have you back with us, and I hand it over to you and your guest. Thank you, Judith, for your kind introduction and to LFF for inviting me to take part in this forum for yet another year. Today, it's my great pleasure to be joined by Dr. Majoun, who is joining us virtually from Beijing to discuss how to harness financing to fight the climate crisis. Dr. Majoun is the founder and the president of the Institute of Finance and Sustainability as well as the chairman of the Green Finance Committee of the China Society for Finance and Banking. Dr. Majun is also the co-chair of the steering committee of the Green Investment Principles for the Belt and Road and the former co-chair of the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group. Over the last 30 years, Dr. Majun has established himself as one of China's leading economists and green finance experts. So it's a real privilege to have the opportunity to catch up with him today, as so as a close friend to the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. Dr. Majoun, great to see you again, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Julia, and it's my great pleasure to be invited by Luxembourg Stock Exchange for this conversation. Let's dive straight in, as I'm keen to hear your thoughts on how we can harness green finance and what China has been doing in this area. This month marks two years since the EU-China Common Ground Taxonomy Instruction Report was initially established. We've certainly come a long way since we first started talking about convergence of language, and I'm sure you remember following the publication of EIB's white paper on the need for a common language in green finance back in 2017. The current version of the Common Ground Taxonomy covers 73 climate change mitigation activities that share common ground for both the EU and China's taxonomy regarding the substantial contribution criteria. In July this year, your team's work at the Green Finance Committee found that 193 previously issued Chinese green bonds raising 35 billion US dollars are aligned with this taxonomy. With even more green bonds being declared as, uh, as taxonomy aligned since then, it's a very important milestone when it comes to harnessing financing for climate-related projects. But Dr. Majun, could you tell us how you see the work between China and the EU evolving in this sense? Thank you, Julie, again, uh, for mentioning this uh, common ground taxonomy as uh, a important um, joint effort between China and EU. I actually started thinking about that back uh, four or five years ago. Um, as you actually mentioned, in 2017, the EIB and the China Green Finance Committee jointly published a white paper on the need um, towards uh, generating a common language to describe uh, green activities. Um, the purpose is that uh, we need to have some sort of a harmonized uh, view on what is green so that we can facilitate uh, cross-border green capital flows. Otherwise, uh, uh, if there's too many you know, different taxonomies, different definitions, then cross-border flows will be difficult as they will involve you know, additional, uh, probably unnecessary um, uh, verification costs. And uh, starting from 2019, um, there was a conversation 
on uh, what to do with the, the international platform for sustainable finance. Uh, at that time, uh, China was joined, was invited by IPSF to join, and uh, we said that uh, yes, we'd like to join, but we also want to propose a specific initiative, which is to create a um, working group under the IPSF to develop um, common taxonomy that's recognized both by China and EU. At that time, you probably know that China had its own taxonomy already, mm -hmm. and uh, Europe was uh, developing the taxonomy. Uh, but we said uh, we need to sort of begin the journey uh, because it will take a long time to reach a consensus. So really started, uh, I think, in 2020, uh, the Common Ground Taxonomy Working Group was formed, uh, which I co-chaired together with uh, Marcel Hag from uh, EU DG FISMA. And uh, now we had uh, actually two versions of a Common Ground Taxonomy published already. The one you mentioned, uh, 72 activities, uh, was the second version. And uh, since its publication, um, many of the usages were developed of the Common Ground Taxonomy. For example, um, I think more than a dozen Chinese issuers have issued international green bonds and they uh, label these assets against the Common Ground Taxonomy. And uh, another effort we are making is to label some of the uh, existing Chinese green bonds issued domestically. And uh, uh, that's uh, 191 green bonds, which we labeled against the CGT in July this year. And in fact, after that, we labeled the newly issued Chinese green bonds domestically against CGT every month. So now it's more than 200. Um, and uh, one more effort we're about to make is to include uh, the uh, green bonds issued in China, not only in the interbank market, but also in the stock exchange um, to this uh, CGT labeling exercise. So once that's done, I think uh, it's gonna be a much bigger pool uh, for international investors to, you know, uh, pick assets from, uh, because once they are labeled against the CGT, the, uh, these assets will be recognized uh, much more easily by international investors, especially from the European uh, investor base. And then they can produce, uh, for example, uh, green bond funds on top of these uh, CGT labeled green bonds. In fact, it was done already by a couple of uh, asset managers just the past few weeks. Uh, one of which was uh, New Burger. Uh, they did one uh, green bond fund based on CGT labeled uh, green bonds and uh, they sold uh, already uh, in the market. Well, it's, it's really great news to, uh, to hear that more and more uh, Chinese uh, green bonds are labeled against this uh, common ground taxonomy. Indeed, I totally agree with you that uh, the visibility for international investors is crucial. Uh, for them to be able to invest and to broaden the scope of sustainable investment opportunities. The Common Ground Taxonomy, as it stands today, places a focus on climate mitigation. But it's true that climate adaptation is also certainly something that could be addressed in the future, as the focus now shifts towards ensuring a just transition. You know that fast-tracking a just, orderly, and equitable energy transition is one of the key pillars uh, outlined for COP28 in a short few days. Um, and you recently spoke about the work uh, currently being carried out by the People's Bank of China on a transition economy. I understand that this taxonomy is currently being studied sector by sector. Could you tell us a little more about this and what it stands to bring to financing China's transition? Yeah, let me add uh, a few more words on the common ground taxonomy, then I switch to the uh, transition taxonomy. Uh, the CGT, um, as I said, has been used by the Chinese issuers and the label Chinese green assets. And now uh, some of these assets are being you know, bought, uh, traded by international investors, but uh, uh, it's not the end of the story. It's actually the beginning of uh, creating a uh, useful reference for uh, many other countries and uh, regions uh, taxonomy. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> for example, Sri Lanka last year, uh, they used a CGT as the building block for their own uh, domestic uh, taxonomy. And uh, Hong Kong, which just uh, published a prototype of uh, its uh, local taxonomy, also used a CGT as a major building block. So I think uh, this kind of usage uh, will also be very important in uh, gradually uh, sort of facilitate uh, harmonization or at least interoperability of different taxonomies across jurisdiction. And also the CGT working group itself is expanding uh, its scope 
in two senses. One is, uh, as you said, uh, we are including uh, currently only the mitigation activities. In the future, we'll be including adaptation, nature, uh, polluting control uh, related activities. And also country-wise, the CGT will expand. Uh, so far, it's a joint work between China and EU, but in the future, it will be involving more countries, for example, Singapore, uh, which has just joined uh, the CGT work. And uh, I think the next version is gonna be a uh, joint product of EU, China, and Singapore. And uh, uh, also we are in talk with a couple of other countries which are interested in joining CGT. So uh, hopefully in a few years time, the CGT uh, will be recognized as a much more broad based uh, common language for labeling uh, green assets. Now back to the transition finance uh, work. Um, one important uh, document which I wanna highlight is the G20 transition finance framework. Um, as you probably know, I was co-chairing the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group, and this group uh, uh, produced this uh, transition finance framework last year, which was endorsed by the G20 leaders in November uh, last year uh, during the uh, Bali uh, G20 meeting. And uh, uh, many countries are now seriously studying this framework and trying to apply that to their domestic um, policy uh, and regulation on transition finance. So China is one of the examples. For example, the PBC has been working on a transition um, taxonomy in four areas. One is coal-fired power generation, second one is uh, steel, and third one is cement, and the fourth one is agriculture. Um, I think uh, the draft is ready. Uh, they are still circulating for consultation, and uh, hopefully uh, it will be a public document uh, soon uh, for public consultation. And at the local level within China, there are quite a few regional pilot uh, programs for green finance, which were more aggressive than the national government. And they already published the transition taxonomy. For example, in Chongqing municipality and Hojo municipality, each of them had their published version of taxonomy for transition. The Chongqing version had 120 um, technical pathways and uh, the Hojo version had 106 technical pathways. So all of these are already guiding financial flows towards uh, uh, transition activities. Excellent, very good to know that uh, transition taxonomies are already published in, in China, like uh, it was well, back in December 2015 with the first uh, uh, China's uh, People uh, Bank of China's um, Green Bond catalog already. Um, so really, really interesting you need to, uh, to underline. Um, thank you also for underlining the expansion of coverage and the expansion of, uh, of scope of uh, the common ground taxonomy, especially you mentioned earlier nature. Uh, and so financing the, the transition away from uh, harmful business practices and operations is indeed crucial to fighting the global climate uh, crisis, but protecting the natural world, uh, the one that home to wildlife and plants is equally as important. Ensuring their protection also help uh, protect us as humans. And biodiversity is also um, a key area in need of financing and protecting in, in China. Um, in this context, what kind of innovations are you seeing in China when it comes to financial products that place biodiversity at their core? Um, yeah, biodiversity is a, a global topic. Uh, now, maybe uh, I'll start with some of the global conversation back uh, about three years ago when I was still a member of the steering committee of NGFS. I co-led the uh, NGFS study group on biodiversity. And uh, within that group, which we you know, spent one year uh, mobilizing participation of uh, uh, 50 something organization, uh, the uh, conclusion of the study was that uh, the uh, biodiversity loss is a major threat to financial stability. And therefore, central banks and financial supervisors will have to care about the uh, biodiversity um, topic, and uh, they need to make uh, efforts to mobilize more financial uh, resources to invest in nature positive activities and uh, also to uh, uh, discourage uh, capital flows towards those activities that damage the nature and biodiversity. So that's a, a very important global conversation, uh, which was followed by many others, for example, last year. Uh, when China was hosting the uh, COP15, and uh, it was ended in Montreal uh, with a conclusion that uh, the world needs to protect uh, 
50%, 30% of the land and 30% of the ocean. And the financial resources needed for that effort is massive. And only 10% of the amount that's needed has been mobilized. That's why uh, green finance and civil finance has to devote much more resource to uh, this space, uh, namely nature and the biodiversity as well. So back to China, uh, what we did is uh, uh, in the past many years, in fact, we have incentivized uh, uh, lending and other investments into uh, areas such as forestry. For example, the China Development Bank has offered a very long term, uh, sometimes as long as 30 years, uh, lending program at a very, very low uh, uh, financing cost uh, with subsidies from the government uh, at uh, as much as 200 basis points. And uh, of course, there are many, many other products uh, that's being used, uh, including the, uh, for example, uh, 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 blue bonds uh, which have been issued, and also uh, many biodiversity related insurance products uh, which have been developed. In fact, uh, in the least uh, recent conversation which I had with the insurance company, they told me that uh, 300 kinds of uh, uh, insurance products have been created uh, to protect biodiversity. That's very interesting and, and inspiring to, to see the way that uh, insurance products can, uh, can develop and are adapting to play a role in, in fighting the climate crisis and protecting the nature. Uh, I, I believe we need to see more of this innovation going forward to ensure that we keep capital flowing towards protecting uh, our planet. On, on the topic of financial products, uh, it's just so natural, of course, to speak about the trends that have emerged over the course of 2023 and what we can expect uh, to see in 2024, especially trends related to, to green bonds. Well, we know that high interest rates uh, have been a common theme throughout capital markets over the last year. How has China's green bond market responded uh, to this so far? And do you see this trend changing uh, in 2024? Uh, well, the Chinese green finance market is uh, fairly different uh, uh, in the sense that uh, we don't follow the U.S. Uh, rate cycle. In fact, the uh, last couple of years, the Chinese interest rates have been coming down. And uh, uh, that's why we were not so much affected uh, uh, in, in that sense, uh, despite uh, the uh, fact that the global green bond issuance was coming down, China uh, green bond issuance was actually rising. Last year, the increase was 50%. And this year, I think a smaller increase, but still, um, I think it will be growing. And uh, uh, products-wise, I think there's a lot of innovation, uh, not just the regular green bonds, but we now have uh, a lot of uh, other uh, green sustainability related bonds, you know, some called carbon neutrality bonds, some called transition bonds, some called uh, sustainability linked bonds, um, and uh, blue bonds, as I, I mentioned earlier, um, all these are popping up on, um, uh, you know, very uh, frequent uh, basis. So promising, uh, promising new developments for, for the future. Um... Thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Majun. Uh, is there anything else you would like to, to highlight for uh, as, as new trends potentially for 2024 or what to expect in, in China? Uh, I think uh, I mentioned transition finance, which is a big trend. Uh, eventually, I think uh, transition finance will mobilize more money than the pure green finance, which went to renewable energy, you know, EV and uh, uh, battery. Uh, we need a lot of uh, financing support for carbon intensive sectors such as steel, cement, petrochemical, you know, mining and so on. That's one big trend. The second big trend is that uh, uh, the sustainability reporting uh, framework, I think will be adopted in many places, including China. In fact, uh, Hong Kong has just uh, announced that uh, they're gonna adopt a ISSB based uh, disclosure framework, which means that the uh, listed companies will be required to report, uh, you know, scope one, two, three, uh, carbon information, the uh, stress testing results, the transition plans, and so on. And I think uh, uh, mainland China will also follow uh, as well. Uh, that's uh, a very important uh, step towards uh, uh, developing a um, you know, ESG um, uh, data uh, system, which will help the uh, financial market to label uh, and uh, compare uh, the environmental benefits of the economic activities going forward. And it's very important development after the common ground taxonomy. Uh, if we manage indeed to develop an ESG data system, which is commonly shared, as uh, that would be a, a very important uh, progress um, to mainstream, mainstream sustainable finance. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, with that, our time interview has drawn to a close. Um, harnessing green finance is a matter of necessity. This year, we have seen the devastating effects of extreme weather events in many parts of the world. As the world gears up for COP28 uh, next month, our discussion could not be more timely. We live in a time where cross-border worldwide collaboration is more important than ever. We must work together to address the challenges that the world is facing. Dr. Majoun, on behalf of everyone tuning in today, thank you again for joining us and for providing your expert advice. It has left us all with uh, plenty of food for thought, and I look forward to continuing this dialogue in 2024 and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie Becker and Dr. Ma Jun. And with that, indeed, the China Finance Forum 2023 draws to a close. We very much hope that the insights and information shared by our esteemed speakers have been of value and of interest to you because with this format we always strive to contribute to a better understanding of the dynamics related to the landscape of investing in China and doing business th with China. As uh, Minister Rhodes said at the outset, in light of the growing complexities of this world, it's important to keep the dialogue going and engage with one another. And so until we continue the conversation, potentially next year, I hope, we invite you to revisit some of the content that you may be interested in. The email with the link should be in your inbox shortly. All that remains to say for me today is a heartfelt thank you to all our speakers, to our sponsors and our media partner, the FT. And I thank all of you for watching and listening and joining the dialogue today. It's been a privilege to share this time with you. Thank you. Goodbye. Zaitien. Xie xie.